Yeah, welcome everybody to this week's episode of the Outlaw Nation podcast. I am your host, as always, John Roca, aka the Outlaw. Uh, guys, guys and gals, so much has been happening this week. Uh, you know, we've got the NBA Finals, we've got the Black Panther trailer, we've got all kinds of stuff going on, um, and this episode of the Outlaw Nation podcast is a mega episode. Uh, I was able to get an interview with Jay Washington, who sat down with me over the phone and we talked about the Black Panther trailer that's coming up a little bit later. And then I sat down with Mark Tyler Nolan, who is one of the people that is involved in the Batman and Bill documentary, which if you haven't seen this documentary, it's a fantastic documentary on Hulu. And uh, Mark Tyler Nobleman is the gentleman who is the writer who uh, kind of got this credit for Bill Finger as the co-creator of Batman. Uh, and it took decades for it to happen. And Mark Tyler came on uh, later in the process. And the the documentary really covers about the work he did and, and how hard he pushed to try to get the credit for Bill Finger and all the legwork he did about finding uh, Bill Finger's um, relatives and descendants to see if they would be willing to uh, go after um, DC Comics or DC as a as a company to give the credit to Bill Finger as co-creator of Batman. It's a fantastic documentary. If you haven't watched this, it's just 90 minutes on Hulu. Do yourself a favor if you're a massive comic books fan or Batman fan, watch it. Um, and even even if you you haven't watched it, you can still enjoy the interview with Mark Tyler Nobleman because he goes into the stuff. But I don't think we reveal too much, too many spoilers. So that's coming up in the middle of the program, or the middle of this episode, rather. And then we wrap everything up. I was able to sit down with Matt Nost, uh, and we did a wrap-up of the NBA Finals and the NBA itself. And, of course, there's going to be time codes for all this stuff. I'm realizing that a lot of you like to have time codes. Uh, for these uh, segments within the podcast. So I am uh, trying to be more conscientious of that and respectful of that. So, all right. Well, so much has happened. Like I said, so much we're going to be covering here in this episode. Sit back, relax. There's going to be no politics in this episode because uh, all that stuff that just happened with Mueller, uh, you know, possibly investigating Donald Trump for obstruction of justice. There's a Washington Post report that came out today as I'm recording this. Uh, there's just not enough time to sit down and analyze everything. It hasn't been official yet, so I don't want to get into too deep of the political stuff on this episode at all. So that'll be next episode, depending on how Trump reacts, how people react, how the senators, legislators uh, on both sides of the aisle react, um, and we'll go from there. So this is just going to be straight up interview podcast. So and I'll do little like intros to each of these segments as we go along. All right. Well, let's get it going. First off, Jay Washington. You guys know him. He's a fantastic comic, very funny guy. He's been on the Schmodown. He's been, you know, uh, uh, Miss Movie's mouthpiece, Stacey Howard's mouthpiece for Tim's Team Six Degrees, and he's also fought himself. He did in the free for all. And Jay is one of these guys that I became friends with really, really quickly. Very fun, gregarious dude. He know he's a former, he's a professional wrestler. He still wrestles every once in a while, but he's a fantastic stand-up. But more than that, he's just a cool dude and a great guy with a lot of knowledge on geek culture culture, sports culture. So it was so much fun to sit down and talk with him about the Black Panther trailer because obviously he's an African-American guy in the nerd world. And I thought he'd be a perfect guy to bring on to talk about it, to talk about the seriousness of it, but also be able to talk about it in a playful, fun way as well. So that's coming up right now after the musical break. All right, welcome everybody back to the Outlaw Nation podcast. As I said at the beginning of this show, we have a very special guest uh, on to talk about the Black Panther trailer that came out. Everyone's been writing about it. Everybody's been talking about it. But uh, I recently ran into Jay Washington. That's who my guest is here, Jay Washington. And he just was so ecstatic about it. He said he couldn't stop uh, watching the Black Panther trailer. And I thought, who better to come on the show and talk about it with me than the amazing Jay Washington Comedian, actor, you've seen him on Screen Junkies, you've seen him on The Nerdist, he's been on The Schmodown, you know, he's been, he's the mouthpiece for uh, for Brienne, for Miss Movies, for Stacey Howard, for Team Six Degrees, and also he's the co-host of the Sidekick Trusty Podcast and a former pro wrestler, so he's already got a, a soft spot in my heart. Jay Washington, welcome to the Outlaw Nation Podcast, man. 
Man, brother, thank you for having me on here. And just for the record, it is now up to 77 times I have watched the Black Panther <laughs> I think that is an addiction. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I have watched one teaser trailer right. 77 times. <laughs> it's not even the full trailer. It's just the teaser. It's just the teaser, man. <laughs> well, it's a te- you know what? And I think with the trailer, you got so much in the teaser. Yeah. I w- I'm to the point, I'm like, I don't kind of want anything else. No, you're already get ready to give me your money and multiple times. Like, you're, re- you're like, I'm going to see this in every version it's going to come out in, right? Like, it's 3D or IMAX, whatever, you know, in 4D, yeah. 4K. I don't even care, right? Right. You, put it, you can put it on Betamax, I'd still go see it. Because <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I, you know, this is that one, this is that character, one of those characters that people have highly anticipated. How would they do a film with them? Yeah. You know, again, Wonder Woman, we had just got that. Everybody's like, how would they do a Black Panther film? Yeah. And then when you started hearing the cast and analysis and Ryan Coogler's going to be the director, you're like, whoa, okay. Then you already knew Chadwick Boseman was playing the role, but then you started hearing more cast analysis. You're like, okay. So they're not playing any games with this. They're going to make sure they go big with this. Yeah. Now it's just, let's see how it looks. And then we get this teaser trailer, and it's colorful, it's vibrant, it's amazing. Right, it's everything you could possibly want, right? I mean, that's the thing that's so amazing about it, is that everything you were worried about, they took care of. Everything that you were concerned they might not be able to get to, they got to. And especially with Anna DuVernay leaving, people were concerned, like, who was going to take over? Who was it going to be that was going to step in? And Coogler seems to have really taken the mantle well and, and taken this thing to, and made it, 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 it is a Marvel film, but is it, but already you can feel that it is its own film, right? Yes, that's what I love about it. Like you just, yep, that's exactly it. It's a Marvel film. We know it goes in the MCU, right? But it has its own look to it. Yeah, it doesn't look like anything else from what we've seen. The color scheme, just alone, the bright and vibrant colors mm-hmm. alone, mm-hmm. make it stand out the most to me. Yeah, and it's interesting because yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Jay. Yeah. The, fa- the fact, sorry about that. The fact that they made, you know, they took a fictional land that we've all read about in Wakanda, mm-hmm. and you hear about Wakanda being so technologically advanced but still keeping to its original roots in Africa. And you see that in the trailer, which was, that was another part that blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. Because like it has been, because it's like the source of where Vibranium came from, which is what Captain America's shield is made out of. You know, we see this whole idea in the trailer that they talk about, like uh, Ponce de Leon, the fountain of youth, you know, these places that are of, of talked about in legend. It was actually Wakanda that they were trying to find in Africa, you know? And so it's so, uh, it's such a great juxtaposition between what we think uh, these legends were supposed to be about and we would accept it. Oh yeah, that makes sense. They would travel to South America or travel to but it's actually always been in Africa where, you know, a lot of uh, history books or science books tell us is the cradle of civilization. So it's just fascinating how they've made this all work uh, in a way that's, I think it's, it's still, it's very African, but it's accessible. Do you know what I'm saying? It doesn't like make it, it's not so steeped into the culture that you can't connect to it. And I thought that's what, what really was accomplished well by the teaser trailer. And then you can see, and the fact that when you realize they shot the majority, if not all of this, in Atlanta, you know, <laughs> right. in Atlanta. So, <laughs> I mean, if you want to get African American anywhere, you go to Atlanta. <laughs> but <laughs> to bring that to life, yeah. for what you saw, the scene where he is walking by the waterfall and the ritual, <sighs> and you see all of the Wakandans standing up on the side of the walls and everything, yeah. and all the different garb, and it's some ceremony about to happen. That alone just caught me you know it's different scenes that catch you like oh my god i'm captivated by this right here the angle of it the shot the lighting the colors right everything right and the cast too right like the cast is such a a who's who of young up-and-coming african-american actors and african-american actors who have been around for decades that steep the film in that great mixture of tradition old tradition and new technology right you get the newer actors and the older actors providing that anchor and that foundation you know with angela bassett forrest whitaker and then you you know like uh, what's this like and, and i should ask you directly right jay no 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 shame and no awkwardness here you're an african-american guy you're seeing yes. you know one of these african american superheroes finally brought to life i mean blade is fantastic but this is something else right so like what was this what was your this feeling is, this watching is real. This? yeah so yeah with blade blade was never like 
Blade was great. I mean, we got Blade 1 and Blade 2, which were amazing movies. Blade yeah. Trinity is a whole other thing in itself. <laughs> but Blade was never that, that focal point, was never that hero everybody attached themselves to. Blade was only really known primarily through the 90s Spider-Man series. So yeah. A lot of people didn't know of Blade. But you get the Black Panther. He, at one point, led the Avengers. You find out he's a king of a nation, a technologically rich, advanced nation. He has more vibranium than anybody in the world. His whole land sits on a vibranium deposit. You hear all these great stories. Right. And you see this, and you always wonder, man, could they bring this to life? You know, at first we got Luke Cage, and you were like, okay, they brought Luke Cage to the screen. Right. But this isn't the big screen. Luke Cage is on the Netflix, is basically on TV. Right. You want to see how they bring the Black Panther to, to, to the big screen to make a major blockbuster movie. And that, as a, as a young black man, as a black man, period, seeing that is amazing. And also, as a black actor, to see all this, the cast like you were just talking about, mm -hmm. you know, to have, a, to have the heads of me and Angela Bassett and Forrest Whitaker, let's just be real. Okay. Their, their, their bodies of work are just phenomenal. Yeah. I yeah. had the honor and the pleasure of working with Angela Bassett on Chirac. So to oh. know to see her and that is amazing. Right. Forrest Whitaker's, Forrest Whitaker's body of work, Phenomenal at Academy Award winner. Yep. I think on both Enos and Academy Award winner. Yeah. And to have this and in the up and comers, Lapita Nyongo, uh, Denai Guerrero, Chadwick Boseman, Michael B. Jordan. Yeah. You have all of these. Daniel Kaluuya, for everybody now knows from Get Out. It is amazing to have all this in one ensemble. Yeah. And from what I'm assuming and knowing how Ryan Coogler works and his mindset, everybody's going to shine. Yeah. You it, know, it's not going to be you're here just as a set piece. You're going to have moments with you, Sean. Yeah. Of course, the focal point will be potentially Michael B. Jordan and Chadwick Boseman, but everybody's going to shine. Yeah, and I think you see that in the trailer, right? Everyone seems to have their moment, right? Yeah, Winston Duke as Man Ape has a couple of really strong moments. Letitia Wright as Suri playing uh, T'Challa's Chala, sister. Is it T'Challa or T'Challa? I, I always. I, T'Challa, yeah, T'Challa's sister. Like everyone gets their like hero moment or villain moment, and so you're like, this is gonna be. Everyone's gonna have a shot to really be adored and appreciated by the audience for the work and dedication they're putting into creating these characters within the film. That's the vibe I get from from just the quick teaser trailer and what you were talking about, like the look of it all. You know, Rachel Morrison. This is cinema. This is an, a female cinema first female cinematographer in the Marvel universe coming out with something this fantastic, you know, yeah. working, working with and I, and I, I'm a, I applaud that too. I was just yeah. about to mention that a, a female cinematographer who captured this beautifully. Yeah. Right. And, and then you, and then you have Ruthie Carter who did the costume design for Malcolm X and Selma and Amistad. Here she is like, those were almost like, uh, what do you call it? Like training ground for what she done. She does here in the movie. And what you mentioned that scene where they're, uh, doing the initiation for him, the the vibrant colors of their the the uh, the outfits of the Dora Milaje is it Milaje is that right is that correct? M Milaje. The, the, the Dora Milaje. Seeing the the outfits yeah, the that they Dora have, Milaje. the the armor that they have for them, yeah, it's all of it is just so amazing and great attention to detail that that really respects the audience and respects the source material too, right? It does. It re it, it definitely re and that's the beautiful thing about it that Kevin Feige allowed. Ryan Coogler them to say, hey, here's the material. You know how to, you, you're going to appreciate this material. You're going to give it reverence. Go ahead and do that. Don't, you don't have to try to change anything else. Let this be what it is. Yeah. And it's, and, and it's, it's appreciated for that. Yeah. And I love the fact that, you know, we start off with uh, Andy Serkis uh, and Martin Freeman going, because Serkis, I mean, what a phenomenal actor, dude. Like, just fun. This is amazing. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> How is this the same guy from 13 going on 30? Like, it's just, he's so, such a chameleon in the different uh, uh, films that he does that he grows so powerfully. And in this opening scene, he's the perfect guy to walk us into this uh, legend of Wakanda. Yeah. And, and Martin Freeman, of course, coming back. So there's so much that is ties into the MCU. But Jay, I don't know if you feel the same way I do, but I don't even need to see any other superheroes from the MCU. I'm okay with just this being a standalone. And then maybe at the end, there's something, but I'm, I, I don't need that's, to just from the trailer. I want, that's what I want. That's yeah. what I want. I yeah. want the Black Panther story to be the villains he deals with in Wakanda. There is no need for a Captain America, no need for a Black Panther, no need for a Hawkeye, a Thor, or a Doctor Strange. Let Black Panther be what Black Panther is. Yeah. He can handle his own. Yeah, and it seems like he's got a good bunch of uh, friends and family members who are 
uh, heroes themselves with their armor, with their skills, with their abilities. So it's not like he's going to be fighting by himself. It looks like he's got a crew with him versus another crew, which is, of course, Michael B. Jordan's Killmonger. Who, and we don't know yet, like, because his history is pretty dark, you know, and so we don't know how much of that is really going to bleed its way into the movie. Uh, but we know just from the look of Michael B. Jordan, even that tuft of hair. <laughs> what do you think about that? The hair choice, like, what was your, I know uh, we, we talked about that the other day, like. <laughs> Michael B. Jordan looked like he about to drop the most fire mixtape ever with that hair. <laughs> like he about to drop the greatest mixtape ever in 2018. But it's to add, I love the way they gave him, like, look, how do you want to portray, you know, you know what this character is, you read up on it, yeah. what flair do you think you can add to it, what do you want to do hair and makeup wise with this character? Yeah. And to go the way he went with it and to have the backstory of it is perfect. Yeah, yeah. You know? We even get that, like you said, the shot of Winston Duke is Manning. Like, oh, you, man. you don't need anybody else outside of, you know, outside of what's there. Again, we may see Bucky Barnes because, remember, at the end oh, of the right. war, that's right. Bucky's in Wakanda. Right. But that's because that's been set up already. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's been set up. I get that. But there's no need to sit there and say, hey, we got to bring Captain America to fly over. No, we don't. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't, you don't even have no Tony Stark. You know what I'm saying? You don't need anybody else. <laughs> Let them all stay where they are. Let this be what this is. This is going to be, this cast can do what it, this, this movie doesn't need that. Yeah. You know, you have a, this, you have one, this is one of those heroes, and I'm going to just say the Black Panther in general, mm -hmm. because you have certain heroes in the MCU who need supporting heroes to mm -hmm. make their stories be told. Nobody will go see a Hawkeye movie by itself. Right, right. It seems like it. Yeah, it seems like that would be more of a Netflix treatment. The Hawkeye story that fits exactly. more that than the on-screen stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting because this character is not like it hasn't been steeped since the, this character. It was in 1966 made its first appearance, so it's not like it's been a, it's been around for a few decades, but not you know as deep as Superman or as deep as Batman. But it's still right around that time when the African American movements were really start. Like obviously the civil rights, and then of course into the 70s with the black with the Black Panther movement. There we go, and and a number of other movements that were going on during the time to fight for civil rights. So it was an extension of that, and it's such a um, an amazing character for them to create at that time. Do you know what I'm saying? Because they've, they've always oh, almost, absolutely. yeah, they've almost always played him for his regalness, his power, his strength. It's not about him making catchphrases or you're, you know trying to be down with the boys. Like he is very much a king, but still with his own journey to go on when he struggles with things. And I think that was so great to create this character. What did you think, too? I think that too. He's a he's a he stands alone on his own, like you just said. Yeah. The reality of it. Again, I'm a king. I don't have to use the puns and catchphrases. Yeah. I don't have to have these clever little quips or whatnot. And even when they do, like one of the things we see in the trailer and we've even seen from Civil War, when someone says something snarky, you don't see Chadwick Boseman come back with any quips. It's yeah. always just that look. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. <laughs> like even the interaction of, the interaction towards when he was leaving, the interaction of uh, Black Widow and Suri, yeah. where she was like, move or be moved. And, you know, he was like, as much as I would like to see that, uh, we got things to do. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, that was such a great moment, that's, right? That's, that's royalty and regality, you know, <laughs> being a regalness to be able to do that. Yeah. And to have that character when he was drawn to be that same way. Yeah. That character has always, I hold my own. I represent my kingdom. The outside world does exist, but I'm more concerned with this. Yeah. If, it, if it doesn't affect my kingdom, I'm not concerned with it. When it comes to affecting Wakanda, that's when I deal with it. And that's what I've always loved about it. Yeah. You didn't have to throw the Black Panther into situations that don't need him because he just wasn't going to be involved in it. Yeah, and he's always, from the beginning, they've always given him a kind of respect in the comics. You know, he's almost like the what they would visualize as a very strong African leader, you know, to to kind of co connect with the, the African-American readers that were coming into comics, that were coming into uh, enjoying this material in the 60s and 70s, and probably had for, for a lesser degree in the 50s and 40s, too. But now seeing a hero that they could understand, they could connect with, was really just a uh, just a very smart move overall. You know what I'm saying by by Stanley. And you had to do that, and you had to do that mm -hmm. because, of course, again, I'm born in the '80s, yeah. raised in the '90s, but I've always heard the stories of the '60s and the '70s, right. the separatist movements, you know, civil rights eras, and things like that, right. where, where people of color in general were ostracized. They were left out. 
So when you had certain things that connected to people of color and it was just something they enjoyed, you would have people of color who love superheroes, yeah. but all they had was a Captain America, a Spider-Man, a, a Iron Man, yeah. a Iron Man. But to give them somebody a Black Panther, which again, the name being synonymous with the Black Panther movement, yeah. but the character, again, the Black Panther being a strong creature in the jungles of Africa. Right. And you give this character that, and then you make his story so rich and so proud and so detailed. And behind that, not only did you make him a king, his greatest warriors are a group of strong black women. Yeah. Yeah. What? You know what I'm saying? So you give all this to you give this to say, hey, listen, it's not to it's not going to ostracize the other way. No, it's to say that, okay, because we've been kept out this long, this is the hero we have for us now. Yeah. And this is how we're gonna build this hero. And uh, over the years, the evolution of the Black Panther comic has been so amazing. They even had a Black Panther series on BET. Unfortunately, it only came on, it was an animated series. It only came on late night. Yeah. So it didn't get the, the due diligence and the justice it deserved. It's a great series. If you ever get a chance to mm -hmm. check it out, I think you can find the episode somewhere. Oh, wow. But that like, it, it was still showing the struggles in the village of Wakanda. You know, it was yeah. still there. It was not Black Panther in America. It was all based in Africa and Wakanda. And they kept doing that. And again, it was like, we're going to keep showing you this. Mm -hmm. And now you take that from, again, a comic book iteration, a small animated series, and now you're making a big blockbuster film with this. It, it's surreal. Yeah, and it's it's unfortunate, right, that the X-Men are not under the Marvel uh, umbrella, too, because one of the big um, early things about Black Panther is his connection with Aurora, with Storm. Like, they got yes. together and they were, they were like, I think they were married or were going to be married and uh, she, she like, oh, he broke it off because he had to go pursue the killer of his dad, you know, of his father. And we saw that highlighted in Civil War and we don't know how much uh, Claw has to do with it or Clue has to do with it and so we'll see how that plays out in the, in the story because they're not releasing too many uh, details about the film. But, it would have been nice to see that play out as well. Him and Storm, like how that have played out with mirroring the Avengers wow. with the X-Men. and all. It just yeah, would have been that, so much that fun. That would have been a great, you know, it, it's hard. I, that's the one thing I, I will say I give Marvel a lot of credit for yeah. that they have been able to do kind of successfully is storylines that they, they kind of needed with certain other characters they've been able to navigate around them. And yeah, the love affair of Storm and T'Challa would have been great to see. Yeah. But Again, you'll have his other love affair with, uh, I can't remember her name. I'm trying to remember what they're going to do, because I think they said they were going to tease one, another okay. love affair. Okay. But you'll have that. You know what I'm saying? You'll yeah. have that. So. Yeah. What do you so? Uh, uh, let, let me let's wrap this up. So we're running out of time. Like, what are you looking forward to seeing in this movie? Uh, like, even uh, you know, obviously we'll have other trailers, but what do you like? What do you want out of this movie? Like, what, what is it you really like want it to accomplish? I, I guess? want this character. I want the Black Panther character to stay strong no matter what. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I don't want to see the we. Which, which I'm assuming we'll probably see the whole thing like what we're seeing with Spider Man Homecoming, where you have to be the hero outside of the suit. Which I can understand right, that, right. and we're probably going to see that. In, in the, and when I say that, I mean T'Challa has to be the king of Wakanda, not just being the Black Panther. Right. So I want to see that 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 coming of age maturity struggle he has to deal with, yeah. because you become the king not by you know you by in a sense default a, a, a sad default because your father passed. Yeah. All of a sudden, you have to take up the mantle. I want to see him dealing with the struggles of now you rule a nation. Yeah. You rule a nation, and in your nation, there are other factions who want to take that from you. But now you also still have this small, to him, a small uh, responsibility of being an Avenger almost. You're yeah. not there yet, but you have this responsibility now because yeah. people know who you are. I want to see the development of that. I don't, again, don't want to see no other Avengers. <laughs> no, I mean, again, Bucky Barnes is established already that he's there. Right. I, if he pops up, I'm fine with it because I know he's there. Yeah. But I don't want to see anybody being brought into Wakanda for no reason. <laughs> That's great. I love that, Jay. <laughs> uh, yeah, because they're like satellite Avengers, both Bucky and, and Black Panther, right? They're kind of satellite Avengers because they both and go on their own journeys in civil war to come around to maybe being part of them. We know that they might be part of the Avengers as it goes forward. So I agree with you. I, I think that those are the only people that should possibly be allowed in the Wakanda story, you know, at this point, you know, um, two things. One, Chadwick Boseman, how much have you, in, uh, were you happy with his casting? How much have you enjoyed him as an actor? Like, what is your feeling there? I was, you know what, at first I was like, Chadwick Boseman, I was like, y'all could have went a lot of different ways with mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. You 
know, I mean, you, you hear who it is, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm good with him, like, but y'all could have went a lot of different ways with this. Yeah. But I'm like, okay, he, he was great and as Jackie Robinson. I actually liked him as James Brown and Get On Up. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, okay, cool. I, I get it. He's got a, he's got some he's got some legs under him. Right, Let's right. Let's see what happens. Civil War comes, changes my whole whole opinion. Yeah, right. He was you so know, powerful. My whole opinion. I'm like, okay, you good? Let's go. <laughs> Perfect cat. It works. It works. Yeah. You know the accent wasn't cheesy. Yes. Because you know he's not. The accent wasn't cheesy. It wasn't over the top. Right. It was subtle enough where it was just right. It was like, okay, I can live with this. Yeah. The demeanor was perfect. The way the expressions were great. So all of that he needed to be in his character. He delivered in Civil War. Yeah. And again, to not be on screen that long, yeah. he delivered that. And so it made me like, okay, when they're doing his movie, I'm here for this. Right. And this is another step for Coogler as well. Like Ryan Coogler, I, I watched Creed again last week. That film is so damn good and this is his third time with michael b jordan you know uh fruitville station being the first time they collaborated Man. what this is this is like the <laughs> scorsese uh de niro uh for the african-american community it seems like right yeah i mean yeah you know what this is this is gonna be I, ryan cook is getting the respect he deserves yeah. as a director again yeah. fruitville station you know, people had to talk about it. The buzz had to be built. It wasn't one of those, you need to see through Bell Station. When the, when the word came out, what the story was, right. people went around and then he got Creed and everybody was like, yo, you have to see Creed. Right. And now, not to take away from Creed nor through Bell Station, it's when the, when you find directors, whether they be male or female, now helming these comic book franchise movies, these big blockbuster films, all the spotlight is on you now. Yeah, you know, because you're getting a movie with you with a minimum a minimum hundred million dollar budget. Yeah, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. What so are you gonna? I'm, what are you? What are you, for what are you gonna bring to the table? And how? Yeah, how how are you gonna use your skills? Like you know, everyone has that moment where they have to step up to the plate, right? And you when you're laying it down on a smaller film, obviously it has its own sets of difficulties and stuff you have to troubleshoot and what have you to create a fantastic film. But once you're handed a bigger toolbox, it's like, what is your creation, your masterpiece going to look like? And right, I think we're both saying from the teaser trailer, we both feel like he's going to knock it out of the park. Oh right, we start. We see his vision already from in a minute and a half. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> In a minute and a half, we saw his creative mindset, his creative eye, his creative vision in a minute and a half. And yeah. also, it looks different than the other films. Yeah. It's not like, oh, you know this is a Ryan, a Ryan Coogler film because it looks like this. Yeah, right. Because Fruitvale oh. Station doesn't look like Creed and Black Panther doesn't look like either one. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great point, Jay. That's absolutely a, a great point. That marks, that's what marks is the markings of a really fantastic director is his ability to change the look or style of film so you can't, you don't even know what film to film, like that it, oh, you, I see the characteristics. Like with Spike, you always have that, that tracking shot. Do you know what I'm saying? You always have yeah. that tracking. Every one of his films, I don't think you see that in every one of Kugler's films. I don't think you see those kind of like iconic things with John Woods, those slow motion doves. You don't see that with Kugler. He has, uh, he, he adopts to the genre, to the style and really uh, creates fantastic films. And so, I just, I, I'm with you, man. I, I can't wait for this thing to come out. I've been going crazy. I haven't seen it 77 times, but I've certainly seen it like 20 <laughs> times because, and in different ways, because I, I want to see it as close as possible. I've gone frame by frame. You know, I've listened to other people break the trailer down and all the Easter eggs and whatever. So there's so much about this story that I uh, am familiar with, but not 100% familiar with, that I'm excited to see brought to the screen. Right, and that, that I think that's the reason... Uh, the reason I have seen it that this this ungodly number of times <laughs> because I, I appreciate the frame by frame the Easter eggs that you find out that you didn't notice until mm -hmm. you see something else you're like oh my goodness I caught that here oh I caught that there I, I caught this person here and there and so you see all these different things and yeah I'm with you 150 percent brother yeah that's awesome Jay thanks so much for taking the time to come on the Outlaw Nation podcast you you are one of the uh, quick friends that I've made during the Schmodown that I've really enjoyed talking to. And so I'm happy you took the time to come and talk and, and talk about the Black Panther trailer with me. Man, I, I echo those exact same sentiments, man. The <laughs> conversations we have from wrestling, movies, everything has been amazing. And I'm enjoying the friendship that we've built. Definitely, definitely. Tell people where they can find you, brother. 
Find me on Twitter, Instagram, at Mr. J. Washington. That's M-R-J-A-Y-W-A-S-H-I-N-G-T-O-N. And find my website, jwashington.com, J-A-Y-Washington.com, and website, and uh, the Trusty Psychic Podcast. Find that, and that's it. Okay, and this comes out on this Thursday. Uh, are you performing this weekend? Are you performing anywhere? Like, are you come, going out anywhere? Man, so actually I am. Friday okay. I will be at the West Side Comedy Theater at 8 p.m. I can't remember exactly the name of the show, but I'll be there. Mm-hmm. Saturday 1st, I'll be doing the Picture This show at the Virgil. I won't be performing stand-up. I'll be one of the first-time animators, so I'll be drawing... Ooh while the comedians are telling jokes. Dude. And then after that, I'll be doing the, doing the comedy cabin in the ho- in uh, the Hollywood Hills. So make sure, again, you go to my website, jwashington.com. All the address information will be on there for you all. That's awesome. Jay, Jay is a multi-talented guy. One of my, dude, you were just want, becoming quickly one of my favorite guys. So thanks again, dude. And, and uh, I hope to have you back on and we can talk some wrestling pay-per-view. We can talk all kinds of stuff and maybe uh, dude, do, do... anytime, brother. Anytime. <laughs> just let me know. Awesome. I will do that. That's awesome, Jay. All right, man. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon jay take care buddy All right, there you go. Jay Washington with an awesome breakdown of the Black Panther trailer and what Black Panther kind of means for an African-American a fan of comic books and superheroes, what have you. So I was so uh, happy to have Jay on. And so it was, it was a fun little, I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was a fun little back and forth. Uh, and I know there's no one who ha- who I know who's seen the trailer for Black Panther been like, eh, yeah, it looks okay. Everyone is super excited, super stoked. And they can't wait for February to uh to go and see it so we'll see we'll see how many people i bring on to or bring uh, out to the theater to see it so uh it's probably gonna be three rows full of people you know we, we wrote my crew rolls deep it rolls hard and it rolls deep uh so there it is um all right so let's uh take a moment and then catch our breaths and then we're gonna go into this um next interview with mark tyler nobleman as i said at the beginning of this podcast he is one of the driving forces of the batman and bill documentary we follow his dogged pursuit uh, to get credit for Bill Finger uh, as the co-creator of Batman. And this is something that had been around since the creation of Batman, obviously, but also through Comic-Con conventions, the early Comic-Con conventions, and a number of uh, instances where they thought they might get the credit and then it didn't really work out. So it's a fantastic documentary, and uh, Mark Tyler Nobleman was really great to take the time to talk to me remotely from his house in, uh, in, on the East Coast. So, all right, uh, here we go, right after the musical break. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, back to the Outlaw Nation podcast. Just as I, like I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, I'm really excited to have Mark Tyler Nobleman on the show. We're welcoming him now to talk about his amazing documentary uh, that he did about the pursuit to get credit for Bill Finger for the creation of Batman, for all the stuff that he contributed, uh, along with Bob Kane. It's called Batman and Bill. You can see it on Hulu. It's a fantastic documentary, about 90 minutes long. And I'm really happy that we were able to get him on the show. So, Mark Tyler Nobleman, welcome to the Outlaw Nation podcast. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here. And what's going on with you? Are you, are you, I know you're out of the, you're out of the East Coast, if I remember correctly. So are you like winding it down for the night? What's going on on your end of the, on the phone here? I am outside of Washington, D.C. And like many writers, I, don't go to bed early enough. I'm trying to get better at that. So uh, even if we were not talking right now, I would still be up with at least an hour or two more work that I would try to get done. <laughs> yeah, you and you you write a lot. Like I, I watching the documentary, I see like, it's like 34 books. Is that is that my like am I above or below? What you've written a number uh, of books. It's, you're below, but okay. I've been doing this 20 years. Right. A lot of the books are for younger kids than. Build a Boy Wonder, so they're shorter, they're simpler. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, uh, that's, you know, and also when I was younger, I had more stamina, of course, so I turned them out quicker. Right. <laughs> that's distraction. That's right, yeah, because you've got a wife now and a couple of beautiful daughters. Um, is that correct on that? One daughter, one son. One daughter, one son. Both beautiful, 
thing. Okay, Thank yeah. you. Definitely. No, no, because you see them in the documentary. You see them, how they, especially your daughter, how she ages from when you're asking her about uh, what your life's work, and she says, Bill Finger, and then to see her elation when you tell her at the end, you know, and I don't want to necessarily ruin the documentary, but like there's that moment where she uh, realizes the fruits of your labor, and she is so happy. Yeah. So it's an amazing moment to and, capture. And it's been really... Um, touching uh, to see how people have reacted to her in the film. Well, yeah. My wife and I are quite private, and we're very careful about what we what we share publicly with sure. about our family. You know, I, I'm I'm active on social media, but it's it's more of an extension of my job than anything else. I right. try to either talk about my work or talk about other people's work that I like, or try to be funny or yes. try to be interesting in some way. It's not it's not too personal. And so to agree to do this movie and have our family in it and our home was, was, you know, we had a discussion about it. So uh, it was not, it was not a, a, a no brainer for us. Yeah. And there are certain to hear people. I'm sorry. Go no, no, go ahead, Mark. Go hear people. What? I was just going to say, so to have my daughter in the film and, and it spans her basically her whole life. Yeah. Uh, but you see her twice, once at age four and once at age 11. Yeah. Is, is, you know, for people that don't know us, it, it, it does come, I, I've been told, I didn't even see it because I, I've lived it. Right. It just comes as, a, as, as like a, a bucket of cold water that I can't believe that this has been going on now, that long. Right. So your daughter's gone from this little tot to this preteen. Yeah. And it's all been caught on film. Yeah, and th those are the things that you walk into in a documentary that you think, you know, initially you're like, well, no, yeah, sure, they can document this or that. And then when you start to see how deep they want to go, how much exposure they need to have in order to create their own narrative. And you understand that as an author, you have your narrative to create when you do your books. You know, you, you sometimes uh, don't understand how deep they want to go and it can be a bit taxing. And there are certainly moments, I think, in the documentary where you're having exchanges with your wife that you can tense. There's a little bit of like, oh, I didn't anticipate you guys recording us in the kitchen. You know, there's that, that kind of moment. And those are little windows right. into the relationship. So you can tell, you know, that it wasn't something that yeah. you guys came to lightly. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. This is not as intensive as it may seem in that sense. Uh, you know, we weren't followed for years. And, you know, in fact, that was a, that was a, that was a, a challenge for the filmmakers mm -hmm. that, you know, most of this happened off camera. You know, I was doing this, as you could see in the movie, right. by myself uh, with no, no one recording it. It was even pre-social media. So I was barely, you know, I, I, there's so many things I wish I'd photographed at the time. Yeah. Um, just as a, you know, I did, I did photograph some, but you know, I'm just much different thinker now. So a lot of the stuff that we had to detect was, as you saw, shown in animation because we had no option. We had no footage. Right. And the, and the filmmakers are Don Argot and uh, Sheena M. Joyce. Um, how, right. and they, the, how, how did they get involved in the project? How did you, who, like who got involved in the project first and like who found each other first is, I guess is the question I want to ask. Well, the project started in 2008 which was wow. two years after I began the research, and I didn't know it at the time, but two years before I would sell the book. So I, I didn't even know that I would sell a book at that point. But I had a friend who at the time worked for a company that was making films, and just socially we were talking, and I told him what I was working on, and he said, that'd make a great doc. And I said, I agree. And he said, well, let's, let's try it. So his company funded... Uh, well, the first the first two interviews, which were the archival interviews in in, in our movie uh -huh. of Lynn and Charles. So I think what it says on the screen is Mark's first interview with Lynn and, and Charles. Right. And they show those older older interviews. And it actually wasn't my first interview with either of them. It was my first filmed interview, right. my only filmed interview with them. But my first interview with them was two years before on audio with no, no concept of a documentary ever being made, no reason to film it. Right. So that was in 2008, but a year later that, that fell apart, and 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 I, I don't I won't go into that whole story, but the, the 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 upside of it was that in doing that, the people that were that had funded those interviews put me in touch with another company that might be interested in taking the baton, and that company introduced me to Don and Sheena, and so oh. we didn't actually start filming until till 2011. Right. That's when Don and Sheena and I filmed some of the scenes that you saw in the film, like mm -hmm. me going to Athena's house and meeting Bruce Wayne, the dog, for the first time. Right. And uh, going to Comic-Con. That was 2011. Yeah. So that also uh, had, had, a, 
had a had a roadblock. We, we we filmed a lot in 2011, and then the same year, the company that was working with us then lost interest. So oh, wow. there, there was a five year, another five year hiatus basically mm-hmm. until the credit announcement, and then we we hooked up with Hulu, which was which was a boon, and uh, the rest you've seen. Well, and there you go, and that's something that lets you know uh, and. As filmmakers, you know, it sometimes can be an arduous process, especially with documentary filmmakers, to have the film finally take it to completion and then released. You know, it sometimes can be a very difficult road, a lot of roadblocks, a lot of uh, obstacles to overcome, financial stuff that, that sometimes drops out in the middle, right in the middle of production. I've, you know, I've seen a lot of behind the scenes and documentaries, and this seems to be something that happens a lot with documentaries because people lose interest, uh, outside forces come in, any number of things can happen, you know? And so it's amazing that you were, that it started in 2000, it, it took this long to finally get it out, but I think I'm sure because it had such a positive result, that inspired Hulu to probably jump into it because they saw a happy ending in the situation. Uh, well, that definitely would, uh, I think a factor for the filmmakers yeah. because you know they need to have an arc, they need to yeah. have a complete story, and we didn't have that in 2011. At least let's put it this way: we didn't have it in the way that I think they were satisfied with. Right. I mean, I I thought this was a great story even before I knew there was an heir. You know, just right. when it was Bill Finger's story, but mm-hmm. then finding an heir and and going through the motions of what you saw in the movie, you know, that made me a part of the story too, a, me, a character in the story. Right. And that makes it a different story. Mm-hmm. So I would have been happy with just Bill's story. Right. But when I became part of the story too, and then Athena after me, you know, we had a, a different, a different story took shape and the directors did feel that, you know, we needed some kind of a, a different ending than what we would have had in 2011. Yeah. Now I think if the company had been interested in pursuing it at the time, we probably would have made do. Yeah. But, um, you know, in the end, I think it was better that we did it the way we did it because then we did get a bigger ending. Yeah, the happy accidents sometimes can be the greatest things to happen in the process of a film, you know, in making a film. The happy accidents sometimes can lead to a better film than what you thought you might have uh, started out doing initially. Um, let, so let's go yeah. back. Let's go back a little bit here, Mark, and talk about. So the film itself, it is a documentary. It, it details the uh loss the the what i want you i don't know how you'd say loss or not, the inability to give credit to bill finger it seems a bit shady that what went on here between bob kane and dc uh setting up the batman situation because bill finger was a, an uh, a writer right and an artist as well uh bob kane had been a part of this situation and it seems like they did some kind of handshake deal from what i'm getting from the documentary and then bob kane went in because he knew the people at dc pitched batman got it sold and then Bill Finger kind of dropped off little by little. Is that what happened? Am, am, I, am I getting that correct? Uh, well, in, in terms of how Bill got marginalized? Yes, or? yes, how Bill got marginalized in the situation. Cause he, yeah. He, you know. Well, first, just to clarify, you mentioned before that he was an artist. He was technically just a writer, although he was a very visual writer. Right. And he did want to be an artist at one point, but he never actually drew comics. Right, because I... I but he was the, but something you mentioned in the documentary is when you when you see his initial drawings, right? The the coloring in of the red and all, or the darker rather, those the darker. Bob, st- Bob those are Bob's. Drawing. Those are Bob's that are the red. But then, yeah, Bob did all the art, the drawing. In the gotcha. Day. Okay. Yeah. So who? But he doesn't does so, doesn't Bill come up with the look with the cowl with the ears and everything to that? Isn't he the one that was suggesting yeah, he changes? Did, yeah. But he didn't. He did do that. Uh, and he. He, he explained what he saw. Gotcha. But he didn't actually draw it. Okay. Gotcha. He gotcha. Said, he, he said Bob these ideas, and Bob executed them. Gotcha. Um, so, the as, as to the marginalization, I mean that's that's one of the big that's one of the big uh, you know hinges on which this whole story turns because right. that's what people want to know is how did, could this have happened? How could Bill have let this happen? Did right. he let it happen, or did he try to do something in his own behalf? So, uh, you know, the film touches on some of this, but part of the part of the part of the answer is that you know this was 1939. Yeah, it was the end of the depression. War was brewing in Europe. Everyone knew it, yeah. and so it was a dark time. And you know, as you know, as we all know from the depression, you know, about the depression, you know, people were lucky to have any work at all, let yeah. alone work that they actually enjoy. Mm-hmm. So, Bill agreed to work. In comics with Bob under the terms of the day, which were usually one person gets credit, 
even though more than one person is producing the, the work. And the person who got credit was usually the guy who started the process. Right. In this case, Bob came to Bill, gave him this opportunity, and Bill said yes. So, you know, to a, to a, mo- a modern ear, it just sounds... It just sounds wrong. Yeah, right. It sounds, sounds crazy. You know, the kind of thing that'd be a Facebook page, you know, the backlash again. You know, exactly. Of course, this other guy deserves to be credited equally. He was there from the beginning, and right. it doesn't matter, you know, what else has been done. You, people get credit for their work, but in those days, it was just a different mentality. Yeah. Now, not everybody did that, I and mean, people and Schuster worked together from the beginning, and they both got credit. Right. Um, but they were a team to start with. Like, they started as a team and then went out with product, whereas... Bob was already working in comics and found Bill, so he felt, I think, that he had the advantage, the upper hand in, mm-hmm. in calling the shots, and Bill was, was deferential in that sense. Right. So that's how it started. But then to, your question was about how he got marginalized, and that, you know, a much deeper dive into his personality and Bob's personality. And I can talk about it if you want to talk a lot just in a row, you know, without a break there. If you want me to, I can continue, or we, we can break it up into well, other questions. Well, first, you. first, yeah, like with... You mentioned Boys of Steel. That's that's the book that you wrote. It's a it's a picture book that you wrote about uh, uh, Siegel and the Schuster. Is that correct? And that's right. And they and you you stop the book on a high note just before they go into you know uh, the fighting for the or losing the credit for Superman or like having it taken away. Is that what ended up happening with Siegel and Schuster? Did they have the, the credit taken away for Superman or was it just that they they signed their their rights away to Superman? Uh, I, well, I'm glad you you picked up on that. Yeah. I, the, yeah, the book is the book is about covers about ten years from about 1930 when roughly when Jerry and Joe met to 1940 or so, right. which was two years after Superman debuted. And at that point, things were just looking great. You know, he was a huge hit. It was before things really got difficult for Jerry and Joe. And I did that on purpose because prior to my, my book was actually the first standalone biography of Jerry and Joe in any format. Which right, is hard to believe. But right, we got to 2008 without. A biography of these guys. Yeah. It started in not just a, you know, a lot, and I, it's not just an iconic character, but they launched a whole industry, a whole genre. But mm-hmm. um, no one had done it, so I was very fortunate. And I ended it on that high note because, you know, everything prior that had covered them just dwells on the, you know, the sadness of their story and the yeah. tragedy and how they sold all rights and you know lost out on millions and then were cut off from their own creation and went for almost thirty-five years with no connection to it. And it's mm-hmm. all devastatingly sad. And I thought, these guys did something great. You know, for once in their in their lives in print, their story should end on a high note. Right. So I, without being dishonest to the story, I mean, I you can do that in, in the kind of books that I do, any book, frankly. You can stop and start wherever you want, as yeah. long as you don't tell something that's not true. Right. So I ended on a high note to, to make it have, you know, this... What's, what, what Superman represents is, you know, hope and positivity. Right. And then in the author's note, I do talk about, the you know... The, the, the infamous shot heard around the world in comics, uh, you know, in the comics world anyway, when they sold all rights for $130. So I don't, I don't disregard it completely. I just don't put it in the story proper. Right. So yeah, those guys, um, you know, they deserve that. They deserve one book where, you know, things look good. good no, absolutely. And did you, do you think this is what, in, like, did you discover the Bill Finger story while you were researching the Boys of Steel stuff? Or did you, did you just, did this kind of fall into your lap? And then you're like, oh no, this is the next thing. I can go and pursue this now. Well, I mean, I I already knew about Bill Finger before I started Boys of Steel, but oh, I, okay. I I don't know. I I mean, I knew very little. Most people knew very little. Yeah. I mean, there was little to, to be found, easily found. Mm-hmm. So I did make a note. I sold Boys of Steel in 2005, meaning I, I wrote it the year before. I sold it to a publisher in 2005, and it came out in 2008. Right. But in 2005, in my master document of ideas, one, just one document where I just dump everything that comes to mind. Uh-huh. It was in early 2005 when I first wrote down doing a book about the creation of Batman as a companion to Boys of Steel, and I put in that document that it, it should focus on Bill Finger for the first time. It right. should be the first telling of the Batman story where Bill is the star, because that's, in my opinion at that point, and obviously much more so now, yeah. Bill was the main uh, you know, creative force behind Batman. Bob was the, the main business move, you know, mover mm-hmm. of Batman at the beginning. Right. But if you want to talk about why people love Batman, it's because of Bill. Yeah, so I wanted that book to do that, and I thought that was kind of radical at the time. <laughs> I think, well, and I think now yeah. it, it certainly played itself, it certainly, uh, you know, played itself out in the way that it, 
it's supposed to. Like we are in the throes of a massive geek culture uh, co-op of, of the pop culture. And so it would yeah. make sense for something like this to come out at this time and you know, uh, cap- capture the public's attention. I-, I know a lot of my friends, when they saw the trailer for this documentary, were trumpeting it all over social media, were talking amongst themselves, like, well, you got to watch, you got to watch this. And I just saw it for the first time two or three weeks ago, and I was just so surprised at this story finally being told in 2016, 2017, why it took so long for something like this to be told. Why are we so slow in 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 detailing and chronicling these kinds of things and and having them come out into the light because it seems like a massive injustice. And for those of us who are not, which I think the documentary does really well, highlights the fact that the reason we love superheroes is because they fight injustice, you know? And so uh, when you're interviewing the old, when they're interviewing the older uh, writers, the older creators, they all speak of Bill Finger as if they knew him. And, And some of them did actually. And they speak about, you know, some of his quirkier traits or whatever, but they also speak about him very lovingly and warmly, you know, and they understood. Yeah. And so that's why it was surprising to me that we're, this documentary is just now finally coming out and he just got credit in 2015. Um, you know, and I yeah. get it. I get I it. know. Yeah. That, you know, as, as a writer, setting my interest in superheroes aside, but as a writer who writes nonfiction, yeah. this is a dream. I mean, it's unthinkable that you could think of another subject yeah. In this case, it's a character, the character of Batman, but it could be any subject. It could be, you know, toaster oven or chocolate <laughs> ice cream or, w- right. or whatever it might be that, is, that everybody knows. And that there could be this big open secret about it that would make a great story, but no one has, no one has fully documented it yet. Yeah. So again, I, I just felt like, you know, I was lucky. I lucked out with Boys of Steel. Mm-hmm. How can I be lucky twice? Not only lucky twice, but twice in the same genre. Yeah. With two things that I'm passionate about. I mean, it just didn't seem... It was like a big cosmic joke on me somehow. Right. But that is exactly what happened. And part, you know, part of the issue with the Bill Finger story is that he died just before he would have been well-documented. Yeah. He died in the early 70s. You know, comic book fan culture really began to take off big time, I would say, at the end of the 70s. I mean, you know, Superman yeah. the movie was the first big-budget superhero movie. Right. And that, I think, you know, had a huge impact on superheroes going mainstream and, mm-hmm. you know, becoming bigger business and becoming yeah. a bigger part of the culture. Right. So I think if Bill had lived a few more years, there would have been some more in interviews and, you know, there would have been more to, for me to, I mean, there would have been less for me to find. Put yeah. It that way. Yeah. So and that's why I think we got, we got this far without a, you know, a Bill Finger movement because, you know, in his day, it was just, it just wasn't done. And he died just before, you know, people would have learned enough about him to do it. Yeah. So then along comes me many years later, and, you know, I guess I just had more free time than everyone else who wanted to see this happen. <laughs> well, that and also what gets highlighted in the documentary is your dogged determination, your your uh, stubbornness to get to the answers. I mean, the amount of work that you put in going through phone books, trying to track down the myriad of connections uh, family connections throughout this whole thing from Bill Finger all the way down to Athena. You know, so many people involved and uh, so many surprises along the way. You know, uh, Bill's son was gay. And so why would you think there's a daughter? Why would you think there's any kind of child? And then we find out right. he does have a child. And those are the twists and turns of the document that I find really interesting. And along with the interviews with people like Kevin Smith and, and other people who are involved who have their opinions of, of, of you know, and championing you, uh, finding this out, there's also this other stuff that's down on the ground, you know, trying to figure out, you know, almost like a detective, you know, and trying to trying to put, this, which is, of course, ironic. And I think they talk about that in the documentary, how a Batman is a detective and you're almost being like Batman trying to find, you know, the truth in this whole situation. Right. Which I didn't sign up for. Not that I was diverse to it, but <laughs> I just sure. didn't think, I, this was different than anything I'd done. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I knew how to do research, but I, as you saw in the film, I mean, most of those examples that we used in the film, you know, me staking out an apartment and calling yeah. every finger in the Florida phone directory. I mean, I'd never done things like that before. Right. Uh, it just didn't, it just didn't, it wasn't, it just didn't, I didn't have a project that required something like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a lot of the research that I did, you know, was not, you know, it wasn't the kind of thing that, I mean, it, it, I, you know, it has a certain effect when people watch it, but really anybody could have had these 
ideas to do these things. Sure. I mean, I just got so consumed by it, like you said, it wasn't an obsession that I was willing to do all this. And at, you have to keep in mind the whole time, everything in that research section of the movie, I was doing on spec. I didn't even have a book contract. So yeah. It wasn't like I knew I would make a dime from any of this. Right. I just got consumed by it and thought, you know, like I say in the movie, you know, everybody wants this. Someone's got to just actually do it. Yeah. So... Why not me? Well, yeah, exactly. And and that's what I think it's almost, um, you're the, you were the pr- right person at the right time. And I feel like you were the, you know, and almost, you're almost mirroring how, how Bill Finger was. Because he, I mean, a lot of the people say he like obsessively researched weird facts and he kept a giant notebook and he would ride for hours on the bus. So you're doing the same kind of work that Bill Finger did to create his characters, create this world of Gotham City in your own way, kind of honoring his way of doing things, how you were obsessively going after the truth here, you know, of trying to go through all the different uh, tactics, all the different, uh, pro- and doing things that you never did before, right? Like you just said, these yeah. are all the things, and so in a way, you're almost mirroring what Bill Finger did in his own work, in your work. And so I, I found that to be something that was kind of maybe a, an off product in my mind, an indirect result of, of, of watching the documentary is seeing how you guys are kind of simpatico in your approach to things, you know? And of course, you're, yeah. you've are you got a nice house and, and a couple of beautiful kids and a nice wife and beautiful wife and everything. So you, a little bit, you're ending up a little bit of situation the Bill Finger did, on, you know? But but the, the traits are there. You know, writers are writers. Writers are uh, uh, an interesting breed and they do that. You know, I, I, we're friends, uh, we're co- our common friend, Mike Fox, he can be quite uh, obsessive or, you know, weird in his way of researching things. And so, and Will, his brother yeah. as well. So, you know, so I, I'm never surprised when I hear about a, a writer's tactics or pursuit or dogged determination because it is something that is gets in your head and it just, it, it's not getting out until you find the answer, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I agree with all that, and certainly being compared to Bill Finger in any capacity creatively is a huge honor. So it, it does, so thank you, and it does, um, you know, that that is a parallel that they played up in the film, mm-hmm. and, you know, it wasn't something that was front of mind when I was doing this, but I could see it in retrospect that, yeah, you know, I, I had to do detective work, right. on, you know, not, 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 you know, not trying to find out, you know, who... D.B. Cooper was the guy right. who started the plane in Seattle in 1971 That's, or whenever it was. Or the Zodiac started. Killer. Or the Zodiac Killer, right. It wasn't exactly. that level of research but, or of that kind of like, you know, investigation. But yeah. there were plenty of things that needed to be dug up, and mm-hmm. I just got really, really caught up in it. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, and Bill was notorious for being late with stories, mm-hmm. not because he was lazy, but because he worked hard and he yeah. would do really meticulous research, not just for the writing, but also to produce, uh, which the film talked about, to give his artist visual reference. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I you know, I get it. <laughs> yeah. I get it. What it's like to put in the time means that sometimes things don't go according to schedule. Yeah. Well, what's great about the film, too, is you see almost a psychological exploration of Bob Kane's personality uh, versus Bill Finger's personality, right? Bob Kane is the showman. He's the wears the cowls to the premieres. He's he's uh, grandiose when he does when he signs his name. It's in a box with the O, very large. Uh, whereas Bill was more of a subdued guy, very quiet guy, did his own thing. You know, I'm sure if he was a boisterous, loud guy, he'd have, he'd have complained for credit. He'd have bitched till he got the credit. And so, these are two different people in the creation of this. Uh, Batman, and you could see shades of Bob Kane in the 1960s Batman, but you can see the more basic uh, uh, um, psychological components of Bruce Wayne and Batman in Bill Finger's approach to things, you know? And so this is what I found interesting as you, you explore this. So how much of this is, is Bill Finger's fault? How much of this is Bob Kane's fault? I like that the film lets you decide that, you know? It, it, it does kind of at moments vilify Bob Kane, but I also think Bill Finger at times because of his personality didn't push for more of the credit or didn't get lawyers, didn't get all this stuff involved because he's it was a different personality. It wasn't his, maybe within himself to be a confrontational person. And maybe Bob understood yeah, that he, and took advantage of that. By yeah. all accounts, he wasn't professional. He was deferential and, and possibly, you know, too too submissive. Right. I mean, there were some pretty heartbreaking stories, which the book didn't, I'm sorry, the film didn't, didn't include, wasn't part of the main through line, but it, it was yeah. mentioned in the book that, you know, he was verbally abused by at least one editor in front of his peers. I, I mean, mm. and, you know, you, you think of black and white movies with, like, the grouchy editor and, you know, almost the Perry White, but 
put yeah. a little bit more craft. And it's almost funny, but in real life, it's, it's pretty sad. It's sad that someone in that, in that professional context would talk like that to someone right. who he's working with and that someone else would, you know, would take it. Yeah. So it, that was pretty heartbreaking. And it's just, just another reminder that Bill, like everybody, could have, who did him something that we, that we admire was flawed. I mean, he's yeah. not just the hero of the story, he's also part, partly the villain. I mean, yeah. in the sense that he, you know, sabotaged his, his legacy in a way by either not doing enough or, uh, or, not, or not doing anything. Yeah. Uh, you know, we know that he did a little. We know that he did talk to Bob a little, but, right. you know, not enough to feel like the guy gave himself enough of a chance. So, yeah. Uh, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's, well, those... Those are the self-destructive impulses of an artist at times. You know, it can it can keep them from achieving the success or achieving the results of their success or the spoils of their success. You know, and so I think that yeah. gets profiled definitely with Bill Finger. Um, he did end up writing one of the episodes, right, of, of the Batman TV series, which uh, yeah. was something he was very excited about and happy about to finally get some credit for. I, I, from what you, the documentary says, right? Yeah, he, that was the only time he saw his name as writer on a first one Batman story in his life. Right. And if it has to be one, you know, that was the biggest, yeah. you know, it was a TV show, yeah. which much more, many more people saw than, than when I read a Batman comic. So that was definitely mm. a point of pride. And, you know, another point of pride was, as it says in the movie, I think, is that he was the only mm. writer from comics to right. write for the TV show. Right. And I think that that was, that was something that, you know, that he cherished. Mm-hmm. Um, right, rightfully so. Yeah. Wow. It, it, yeah, and it profiles. And I wanna, if you don't mind, John, I want to before I yeah. forget one point. Yeah, just please. Going back for a second, when we talked about vilifying Bob Kane, now you know it's no it's no surprise that I, I'm no fan of Bob. Right. But our intention and my intention from the start was not to vilify Bob, but rather to build up Bill. But it became clear early on that to build up Bill, you, you will by default, by definition, be by tearing down Bob a bit, mm-hmm. but I was just careful on how I did it. I just tried to stick to the facts. I tried to let Bob speak for himself, and that was even more apparent in the movie when they used some really great archival clips, which is totally Don and Sheena, they, they dug, and, and their team, they dug mm-hmm. this stuff up that was not part of my research. So good on them for that, among other things. But that was a very important to me because, you know, I'm a writer, I want a good story, yeah. and I want, to, you know, I want there to be a hero and a villain, but I'm also want to be fair and I never met Bob mm-hmm. or Bill so for me to be too disparaging of Bob would be unfair would be not my character anyway and also just not really serve the story because mm-hmm. you know he's got to he has to it, it had to come from him yeah you know I don't remember if anyone else in the film pairs him down a bit but you know I I'm very clear about it yeah. these are the things that Bob did professionally I don't agree with them mm-hmm. but I didn't start labeling and calling you know, getting getting um, fiery about it the way you see a lot of people on Twitter doing yeah. in response to the film. And that's totally fine. People need to be human. Yeah. I just chose as the writer not to do that. And I think it's sort of my, my, my end goal. And again, just building up Bill was the, was the goal. And, you know, mm-hmm. and everything else was, you know, was a byproduct of that. Well, and that's a good point you bring up. And that's where I was going to go next, that we, we get to hear from Bob Kane's own voice in that interview he does on the audio cassette that they have, the recording, where he is saying that Bill uh, deserved more credit than he should have gotten, you know, and after this is two years after Bill had died already and you can st- the cell you can tell this is a man in Bob Kane who is nearing the end of his life and he is trying to uh, rectify all accounts you know he's trying to to do that in some small way but in the but then even after the interview he doesn't a hundred percent give the credit to Bill and and does those and he does written interviews as well you know because obviously when he was first confronted with this in the in one of the comic conventions he wrote this scathing letter about how he's the only creator and anybody saying anything else is a lie and he forced the Batman fan club people to to print that letter so there's a lot of sins it seems here that have to be atoned for and who knows how much of the guilt he carried with himself knowing that he had screwed someone out a friend of his out of you know credit for a creation and had reaped the benefits and the rewards of it um you know yeah. how much of that uh, you know worked on him inside psychologically because i think as human beings as we get older this whole desire to be you know, to to be like the make all the money and be the one and blah blah blah. It kind of dissipates to that point where you start to face your mortality and you're like, I need to, you know, I need to set the book. I need to set the record straight. 
you know, in case anything, in case I pass before it happens. And I think Bob was kind of working his way back towards that. It seems like from the film, and I don't know, what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I see it along those lines. You know, this was a guy that made a career of taking credit for work that he didn't do, and I think at one point he, he, he matured in a way, he, or he developed some, some new level of conscience, yeah. and he realized that, gosh, you know, my legacy is supposed to be that I'm the creator of Batman, but it could become that I'm the guy who cheated the main creator of Batman. Right. So he was he was pulled in both directions, like, and I say it in the film. Yeah. He could have decided to just ride it out and see if it would carry to death, or he could come clean and possibly redeem himself with his honesty, but he kind of went down the middle. Yeah. You know, yeah. He, he admitted that Bill was instrumental and said Bill should get credit, but then just said, okay, see you later, boys. <laughs> you know, didn't do anything about it. Right. And that is, you know, an example of what my dad would call, you know, if you're going to talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. Right. So right. I think Bob felt, I think that was probably a really big deal for Bob to say in the book. I mean, I know it was because Tom Andre, the co-author, the main author, yeah. basically co- you know, coaxed him into doing it. He wasn't voluntarily going to put that in the book. Right. So Tom is a huge, you know, huge hero in the story for doing that, yeah. for talking to the man whose life he was writing about and saying, look, you've got to give other, this other guy credit too, you yeah. know, it's your book. So I think that Bob felt that he, he did it. Yeah. You know, I, I okay. I finally told the truth. I feel I feel relieved now. I can I can go to my grave feeling redeemed in a way, right. not realizing that it would. I think it backfired. You know, it, it was uh-huh. it was great for the Bill Finger cause. It and it was you know it went a small way toward the Bob Kane cause of redeeming himself. Right. But like I just said, if you say something but don't do it, you know it's it's almost it's like a it's like a it it, it cancel they cancel each other out. Yeah, exactly. You know, it doesn't it doesn't really help him. So I think he, you know, he did feel it, but he didn't have the, he didn't have it in him to go go the go the distance with that. Right. If Scrooge, Although he would have, yeah, he if, easily could have, but he didn't do it. Right. Exactly. If Scrooge wakes up the next morning. And all he's done is learn the lessons, but he doesn't go and get the fatted goose and go to see Tiny Tim and go to see Bob Cratchit. Then it's not as powerful right. of a story, right? It's not as powerful of right. an ending. It's not as we don't see his conversion as completely, and and that's certainly seems what what happened with Bob Kane. And of course, me, I don't, I never, uh, you know, I never met Bob Kane or talked about Fing- Bill Finger either. So, but it seems to be from what we've seen in the documentary that. That is what happened. He'd walk down the middle instead of fully going in the other direction and giving Bill his credit. Um, you do ev- right. we do eventually f- get the credit in 2015, right? It goes forward. Um, you do the research. Bill was married twice. I mean, even with his his personality, his self destructive impulses, his weirdness, he was still married twice. You know, to two different women, Portia and Lynn. I think they say other wives, and uh, and with mm-hmm. with Portia he had Fred. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Portia was his first wife. They married sometime in the 1940s. Right. And they had Fred in 1948. Right. Let me just double check that in my mind. And Fred died in 1992, so... Right. I, I'm... I'm blanking momentarily on what year Fred was born. I've got it in my notes, of course. I don't think okay. it matters how much yeah. to listeners, but yeah. I, I, I believe it was 48. What, uh, uh, and then yeah. Bill and Portia's marriage ended in the 50s. Right. And Bill began to see a woman named Lynn, and they ended up getting married in the late 60s. And that was a short marriage. They divorced in, I believe it was 1971. Right. And then Bill died three years later. Right. And from what I get from the documentary... Um, both Portia and Lynn wanted him to have credit, wanted to get credit, uh, and and probably pushed him in ways, in the ways that they could in relationships as you tried oh, yeah. to do. I mean, yeah, I I I I I heard, you know, not anecdotes, but you mm-hmm. know, I heard you know vignettes about Portia. I mean, she was apparently a very um, and buoyant, vivacious, lively woman. Mm-hmm. And also quite bright. And so she, I believe, did push Bill to do more on his own behalf. Yeah. And probably, you know, was the more dominant in the marriage, at least in that, with that. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know how much that contributed to the marriage falling apart. Maybe nothing. I don't know. But I, she definitely, 
at least according to a couple of the golden agers who knew her, yeah. would have would have been nudging Bill to do more, you know, because, you know, they had a young son, and yeah. that's just what you do. Yep. You know, you, you provide for your family. Yep. So Lynn also, as you see in the movie, even though she came in much later, you know, she, you know, actually her main, her main, uh, uh, her, her main action in that regard was, was after Bill was dead. I mean, as yeah. you see in the film, she tried to get him credit in the first Batman movie, the right. 1989 Tim Burton movie, which was just so great of her. I just, I was thrilled that she did that. I was yeah. thrilled that she had the paper trail. And I was really thrilled and surprised to find that it seemed like she came close. Mm-hmm. Succeeding, which would have changed, I mean, you know, that would have changed this whole story. Yeah. I mean, if he had gotten credit in that movie, you know, I probably wouldn't have been necessary. Yeah, right, exactly. And then Fred also took the mantle, too. And, you know, we they highlight uh-huh. in the movie that Fred has, you know, obviously was struggle, it was a homosexual at that time, was a homosexual right in his life, but during that time, not the easiest time to be homosexual, he did get married. But And Bonnie seems very, which I was fascinated by, very understanding of the situation like she was like i she it seemed to sense that she knew he was gay but or bisexual rather and so she was willing to accept the situation as it was and loved him seemed to love him uh and then you know they had a daughter athena and you were surprised to learn that he had a daughter um and you went and and you know it was so amazing to see you go down there and you know, you know meet her meet athena and then meet the dog's name bruce wayne which is so fantastic because that lets you know just like any family the stories are told from generations down you know and the fact that yeah. she was a when she you know she was a young girl she was writing how my my grandfather was the co-creator of batman in a little uh, elementary school uh, writing assignment like all of that just lets you know that no matter how much tragedy or how much you know uh anger or not credit or credit that wasn't given it was still passed down from generation to generation it still mattered you know and i thought that was a great thing to discover with Athena and her joy in having you come and meet her and speak about it, you know, and she wasn't embittered. She didn't seem to be embittered by the situation. You know, I think that was also surprising too. Yeah. She's, I mean, she's, I mean, you see for yourself in the film and you can make your own impressions. I, I was always very struck with how, how, um, you know, how evenly she handled all this. Yeah. I mean, obviously there was a lot of emotional turmoil going on behind the scenes, which I did not know about at first, but mm-hmm. that was related to her family. Right. Not related to Batman. And so, you know, and the film covers that, and I think covers that, does a nice job of covering that. Right. But yeah, she was, you know, she was, uh, she was very even about it. I felt that she was very grounded. I felt she was very centered about the whole thing. Yeah. You know, she didn't get, I don't, you know, she, you know, she didn't, um, she wasn't rash. She mm-hmm. was, you know, she was trying to do this the right way and, and that takes more time sometimes. Yeah. So I was very, I was very impressed with that. I mean, you know, she has no precedent for this. I had no precedent for mm-hmm. this. So, you know, some people would just be very hasty, um, you know, very greedy. Right. And she was none of those things. She was just, you know, she just wanted credit. She wanted mm-hmm. this to be done properly and she just never thought it was feasible that's why she didn't do it on her own yeah she took an outsider to to nudge right and but also even after the nudging she didn't take the payoff she wanted what was right and so you're right she could have gone the other route and just take it because from what i right didn't they send i think there's a scene in the movie they, they send her like uh, thank you money or or, a, or something like that effect a check to try to buy her off to a degree and well, that's two things. Yeah, they they sent they sent her they began to send her royalties for reprints of Bill's story. Right. Almost immediately after she contacted them, so I found her in February two thousand seven, and mm-hmm. I want to say by late March she was already receiving these checks, which were you know again just for reprints of Bill's stories. Not it wasn't some big royalty check for right. Batman. It was specifically tied to reprints of Bill's yeah. work. So it was more than she was ever getting. It just wasn't nearly what the family, in my opinion, deserved. Right. Um, but then the other thing that you're talking about came much later. Well, five years later, about 2012, during Dark Knight uh, Rises right. uh, year, when they were asking her to terminate her rights, basically saying, you know, you'll, you're saying that you're never going to make a claim <laughs> that you deserve more for Batman. Yeah. And that she did not sign. Right. And that, but that tells you the, and that's what's like. That's what's so good about the documentary is, even in our modern age, 
when it's so obvious that a person deserves credit for something, the corporation will fight to the last degree until it finally gives in. You know, and that was their last tactic, it seemed like, or one of their last tactics to keep the credit and keep the money flowing at a, at, at, in their direction. And, and uh, you know, Athena could have easily signed that away, taken that money, and just been done with it. But there was a bigger cause here and a bigger, bigger um, principle, you know, and I think that was so great for you and Athena to come together and, you know, give the legacy back to Bill Finger. And now it is there. And the shot of you when you see his name come up on the screen uh, for Batman vs. Superman is so fantastic, you know. And the fact that it took still, what, seven, eight years later after that 2008 situation to finally, yeah. you know, to finally make it happen is, that's what... Sometimes you just have to keep pursuing it. You have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And obviously, this has been going on for decades. Because not before you were even born, people were pushing to try to give Bill Finger credit. And here you come along at this time, and this and things just kind of line up when they're supposed to line up because of of the perseverance and the people involved in the situation. You know. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was as you just said, it was a long. It was a long journey, right? And and you have been you have been getting some comments. I saw, I saw some comments on Twitter, and Instagram. Some people are like saying, "Oh, they make the documentary. He made them a documentary about himself. They're making it about himself." But I, I'd like you to talk about that real quick because my opinion is this is what a documentary is. You find what the narrative is, and the person guides you through it. Do you know what I'm saying? And yeah, and, and I think. No one else was doing it. And all these people criticizing. I didn't see any of them trying to get Bill Finger credit. So to me, it's almost, right. it angers me when I see that because I go, that's armchair warriors who didn't do crap yeah. to to try to give Bill Finger credit. And they're going to take apart this documentary because they think it It seems like Mark Tyler Nobleman is making himself bigger than what he is. But that's not what's happening right. here. Someone had to do it and none of them were doing it. Yeah. Right. So I'm sorry. So I'm sorry. Tyler. Right. Go ahead, please. If you want to no, speak okay. to that. Yeah. Um, so, um, in their defense, <laughs> they've never made a document. They've, they've never made a documentary, nor had I. Yeah, true. So when I first <laughs> began this conversation with Don and Sheena, in my mind, it was going, going to be largely about Bill, which means it would be archival. It would right. take place in the past. Right. And Don and Sheena, who had done this before, made documentaries before. They said that. What a lot of people don't realize is that if you're making a documentary that you want to be relevant mm -hmm. and you want to um, really have a chance of standing out, I think it would be fair to say, it needs to have a contemporary component. Yeah. So they, they said, you know, there's, and I've never seen a Ken Burns, I know he's immensely successful, I've never seen any of his wonderful, it sounds crazy, it's a self oh, wow. story that I haven't, but... Yeah. Uh, I've never seen his work. I just know how respected it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's lar I, I, as far as I understand, it's largely archival. You know, they're they're just yes. they're, they're using, you know, photographs and lots of talking heads, and they're they're making it vividly. But you know, there's no there's nothing there's no unpredictable thing that's going to happen at the end. Right. You know, if you know about the Civil War, you know about baseball. You know, you know a lot of the stuff that's in the story. All yeah. Right? So what Don and Sheena said is, you know, to make this have legs, we want there to be something that the public doesn't know yet. Mm -hmm. So even if you're a huge Batman fan and you know about Bill Finger, and you might not know everything in the movie about Bill Finger, but you know some, we still want to have something that people can root for. Because yeah. anyone who knows about Batman and Bill, meaning Batman and Bill Finger, is yeah. going to know that he died with nothing. Yeah. So the film can't end like that. There's got to be something else. Mm -hmm. So that's why they decided to focus in on me, because I'm in the present, I'm, and I had an unknown end. Yeah. I had something that we could you know, beyond, you know, that could keep someone vested in the movie just to see what happens if, if I succeed. Yeah. We, we, already, we already know that Bill did not right. succeed in getting his name on Batman. So that's why they did it that, that like that. Also, frankly, just purely from a, you know, logistical perspective, we didn't have any zero footage of Bill. Yeah. We had, you know, some audio, but no video and no archival footage of anything really related to him. Mm -hmm. So we, you can't build 90 minutes on, I mean, you can, but it would be pretty, it would be pretty, it would be, you know, pretty, it would be bad yeah. on, you know, just talking heads about people like me and other people that never met. Him. Right. You know, there has to be something else. So a lot of, you know, the critic, there was one particular Twitter 
chain that I think you're referring to. Yep. I, it's been 99 percent positive, and then there was this one, you know, one chain that was that was quite negative. And you know, what, what a lot of them were saying was, you know, I like well, not a lot of them, but what, what some of them said is that I, you know, I like the Bill Finger stuff. I just didn't like the narrator guy who was, you know, <laughs> making it all about him. <laughs> and so, just so getting back to what I said at the beginning, yeah. in their defense, they don't know. They weren't thinking about how a documentary is made. They don't yeah. understand this. This, this side of it because they've never done it. And also, uh, I'm not the filmmaker. <laughs> I did right. say that in response to one of them, and I got I got roasted for that too, just by civilly saying, I didn't make the movie, I'm a character in the movie, I didn't have anything to do with how it was framed. Right. So it isn't like me being a narcissist making this movie about myself. Right. Um, and that did elicit one person saying, oh, I didn't realize that. And, you know, but, you know, that, that that's, that's the long-winded answer to respond to that situation. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I host shows, uh, obviously this podcast, and I do some shows over on Collider for YouTube, on the YouTube networks there. And so we'll get comments from people all the time, you know, and that's just part of the business now. You know, as, as great as the explosion of geek culture has been in the in the pop culture, it also comes with a lot of uh, anger in the comments, a lot of vitriol in the comments. And so this is just, you know, no matter what you do, there's going to be somebody who's going to, who's, who's certified on Twitter, who's going to have some issue with what you're doing. It's just part of it, unfortunately, you know, but I, I want to end this in a, in a better, I want to uh, ask you one last question here, uh, Mark, and I really appreciate all the time you've given me here. Um, do you have some favorite Batman comic? Like, are you a massive comic book collector? And if you do, do you, are, are there some Batman, like are your favorite Batman graphic novels or Batman stories that you really enjoy reading over and over again or that you could use as reference points for yourself or maybe even pass on to your daughter and your son? Well, I, I, I'm, I am a collector, but not a massive collector. And I'm yeah. not a collector for collector's sake. I mean, I, I keep the ones that I like and I... Right. I give back the ones that I don't or, or somehow, you know, give them to a, make sure that they're somewhere where they'll be appreciated. So I have, you know, I've been reading comics since I was a kid and I, I have only one shelf of, of long boxes and they're actually the short, the short long boxes, the short boxes. Right. Of comics. They're not, it's not, it doesn't represent my full comics reading career. Right. So I don't, and I, I reread them when I can. I, I mean, you know, our life is so busy, right? So I, right. I, you know, I have so many other things that I want to read too. So I, Typically in the summer when my travel schedule slows down, I'll reread a few series, and it's not always just Batman. It's, I mean, Bell BC for the most part, but it, right. it could be anything from Crisis on Infinite Earths, which I reread last summer, to you know, Batman Year One, which is I think my favorite Batman story. Right. Um, but nothing that I you know reread on a on a on a schedule. Gotcha. And the Crisis on of Infinite Earths. So are you talking about the 1980s one, or are you talking about the one that came out a few years ago? Oh, yeah, no, not the original. Yeah, that's right. Infinite Earth, 1985. Damn right. That's right, Mark Tuttle. No problem. That's right. That's the best one to read. Yeah. The one with uh, yeah. uh, Superman holding Supergirl. Uh, issue. I know I have that entire right. ex, ex, you know, collection the of those. Flash Dies. Yeah, the Flash yeah. Dies, all that. So spoiler, good. 32-year-old spoiler over Flash Dies. <laughs> He's died many uh, times. Many times. <laughs> Uh, well, Mark, thank you yeah. so much for taking the time, man, to talk to me about this documentary. Because I was so... I was so in love with the documentary and I posted on, on Instagram and you were very kind to comment back and then to find out that in a random conversation with my friend Mike Fox that he, you know you were a groomsman at his wedding and so to, this was all yeah. kismet to have you on the show and so I really appreciate you coming on, man. Well, I appreciate you asking. I appreciated your post. Didn't make the connection at the time myself. Yeah. Um, even though apparently we met at the wedding. It wasn't yeah. the biggest wedding. So yeah. we probably did meet. But I'm we sure didn't know we did. that our futures would, would intersect like this. That's so, right. That's right. <laughs> um, but I appreciate you uh, asking me to come on. And, uh, you know, Mike, of course, uh, is is worth doing any kind of favor for. You, I, you know, he's a good yeah. man. He signed Mike at but He was at my wedding. He signed Mike at at my wedding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, is there is there um, anything you want to promote or pitch? Or where can people find you on social media? Can you uh, shout that out? Um, well, I've got a blog called Noble Mania. I am on Twitter and I'm on Instagram. I am not I'm not the most uh, Instagrammy guy mm -hmm. that you'll meet, but I am there. I, I'm probably more active on Twitter. Um, although lately, it's just been a lot of responses to the film because it's been such an overwhelming reaction. I, yeah. I'm just trying to honor and acknowledge everybody who says something nice about it, mm -hmm. and the ones who don't. Just trying to simply say right. thank you for watching. Right. Um, but it's, like I said before, luckily it, it happens to be. Ninety nine, ninety eight, or ninety nine percent positive that I've seen, and I'm very humbled by that. So, yeah, yeah you can follow me on Twitter at 
M A R C T Nobleman, Mark T Nobleman. Okay. And if you, you so choose, and uh, that's that's all I got. Uh, yeah, and you speak, right? You go and do you still go and do speak uh, speaking engagements at at uh, elementary schools, high schools, uh, middle schools, that yeah, kind of thing. Okay. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. I do speak regularly at all kinds of venues during the school year. It it is largely elementary and middle schools, public or private, all over the world. Actually, I I do plenty domestically, but I've I've been doing quite a few internationally as well. International schools meaning they're in another country, yeah, um, and they have kids from all over the world. But language instruction is in English, so I can go there and speak my native tongue, and they understand me. That's awesome. So yes, if anybody listening is works at a school. Uh, has kids at a school or just knows people at a school who might be interested. In, many schools have author visits as part of their yearly, you know, schedule. They they budget for this. They they consider it a valuable part of enrichment. Mm-hmm. So, yes, please don't hesitate to reach out to me on Twitter or just by email, and I'm happy to send you my information. I'd love to come to your school. There you go. And he's a great speaker. You'll see some of that in the documentary if you haven't seen it. Uh, so, yeah, see that Batman and Bill, it's on the it's on Hulu still, so go and, and watch it and enjoy yourself, especially even if you're not a massive comic books fan or a Batman fan, it's about justice. So it's worth your time, the 90 minutes you spend to watch it. It's an enjoyable 90 minutes, and there is some fantastic twists and turns you don't see coming, and it's an inventive way to do a documentary to mirror some animated sequences with some with obviously uh, real-life sequences. So I'm, I'm such a massive fan, and so it was such a great uh, uh, time to talk with you, Mark, and thanks again for coming on the Outlaw Nation podcast. Well, thanks again for inviting me, John. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, guys, we'll be right back right after this musical break. All right, there you go. My interview with Mark Tyler Nobleman. Uh, Really gracious uh, of him to come on the show and talk to me. He had turned down a bunch of podcast requests. Um, He had told me when I asked him to come on the show. uh, But the reason he came on is because we have a very uh, cool common friend between us. uh, Mike Fox, who's a writer, and his brother Will. They both write for some animated shows and other shows around town. And just randomly, apparently, we had met at Mike Fox's wedding, which was a few months ago. Um, and he was a groomsman for Mike, and I was a guest, and we just apparently had met, but I had no recollection of it, and he neither does he. But the other night, I just, after I'd seen the documentary, a couple days later, I went and hung out at a friend's house whose wife was out of town, and he was throwing like a dude's night. We were we barbecued, there was a bunch of us, we barbecued, watched John Wick 2, and somewhere in the middle of John Wick 2, we took a break, uh, one of the guys I was talking to was mentioning the documentary I was watching, and then my friend Mike Fox was like, well, you do know he was a groomsman at my wedding, right? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, yeah, Mark Tyler was uh, there at the wedding. He was up, And I was like, man, I don't remember meeting him. And he said, well, look, let me, I said, I'd like to interview him for the show, for the Outlaw Nation podcast. And he goes, well, let me reach out to him and see what he says. And sure enough, he put us, he hooked us up, and Mark Tyler said, um, you know, I've turned down just about every podcast request because I just wanted the film to speak for itself, but... Because you're a friend of Mike Fox's, any friend of his is a friend of mine, and I'm happy to do your show. So it's just a, you know, it's just a a fate just kind of put us in the situation where I could interview him for this episode of the Outlaw Nation podcast, and I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. All right, let's take a quick musical break, and on the other side of this musical break, Matt Nost comes back on the Outlaw Nation podcast, and Matt and I talk about the NBA Finals, talk about how this all went down with the 4-1 victory of the Warriors over the Cavs, and then we talk about what's next for the Warriors, and most importantly, what's next for the Cavaliers, what's next for LeBron, uh, what happens to Kevin Love, and then we also talk about how this style of basketball that the Warriors are playing, this juggernaut of a team that they've built, how this will affect a lot of the offseason moves for a lot of the other teams in the NBA and what it could mean, who could go where, and draft picks and all that stuff. So Matt and I went real deep into this. And uh, for those of you who know and listen to the Top Ten Show, you know we are mad NBA fans. And so it was a blast to be able to sit down with Matt for a little while and, and, and talk about this stuff. So right there, on the other side of the musical break, Coming up, me and Matt talk in the NBA Finals. Stay tuned. All 
right. Welcome, everybody, back to the Outlaw Nation podcast. Just as promised, Matt Nost is here. We are going to talk about the NBA Finals now as postmortem. It's still within the same week, so it counts. So if you've got an issue with it, if, you, if you've listened to a bunch of other people talk about it, you haven't listened to us talk about it. So now sit back, relaxed, and we're going to talk about this thing. Matt, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. It's <laughs> nice to be back in the nation. Yes, in the nation. Right. What? Okay, so you were right. I mm-hmm. will admit this publicly, recorded for all time. You were well, right that the well, Warriors would win. <laughs> we already have it on record that the Warriors will win. I yes. Fig- my guess was 4-1. It was. A five-game series. It was. I figured the Cavs were strong enough to take one game. They almost took two. That game three, man. What would have happened it, if they had won that game? Do you think they would have come out just as hard in game four? I feel like game four was so desperate because they'd lost game three. Game four was one of the worst games I've ever seen. Like, and do you mean officiating or do you mean playing wise? Um, or all around? I, well, the the officiating just led to just gnarly play where mm-hmm. guys are taking cheap shots, they're getting chippy in right. each other's faces. Right. And I know the NBA wanted a game five minimum. Yeah. I'm not saying they influenced the refs, so they're happy ultimately with the outcome, but they can't be happy with the product on the court because right. that was just hard to watch. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just stoppage of play where they go and look at replays over and over again mm-hmm. and assessing random, you know, technicals and certain things getting called and other things just not. And you're like, there's no consistency here. Yeah. It was just ugly as all hell. It was wonky. Yeah. Because like it seemed like Draymond should have been kicked out of that game on a couple of occasions. And then they adjust the tech. So he's not he didn't get the tech in the first half yet on the official score sheet. Yeah. He it had. said that he had the tech in the first half. And then they adjusted it to Steve Kerr to keep him in the game. It. It just seemed that there was a lot of fishy stuff going on with that game. As great as the Cavaliers played, you also have to factor in, like, the the ref that was there is a ref that has uh, refereed the last three victories the Cavs had over the Warriors. So it, was, it seemed a little like Bill Simmons talks about this, how they sometimes assign certain refs that are favorable to certain, yeah. certain teams at certain moments in the finals or in the playoffs to keep series going, to make money, whatever. Mm-hmm. Do you think that was a part of it? Or you don't want to say nefarious, but do you think that may have been factored in? I... I I don't know. I I actually don't know if the NFL, uh, the pardon me, the NBA refs association schedules the refs, and they have yeah. to run it past the NBA. The NBA chooses. Right. I don't know exactly how that's done. I yeah. know there are certain guys when they come in, yeah. certain, you know, teams feel oh, shit. We're going to get a loss tonight because that guy hates us. Right. Like uh, and, what's his face with the war, with the uh, Spurs with yeah. Duncan and stuff. Crawford yeah. with yeah, the Spurs. Crawford with the Spurs. Yeah. Um. And there was you know the the one ref you brought up. He's actually the. The last time, the last eleven times he refed the Cavs, they'd won. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, there you go. Look, could that be coincidence? Sure, sure, sure. Or you know, maybe there's a slight bit of bias. Or yeah. um, does the home crowd influence any of those refs? Yeah. Uh, who, who knows? I don't know. Right. But it was an it was an ugly damn game. Yeah. It, as as amazing, like, and it was almost lost to history. Because it's almost going to be lost to history because although they scored the most threes of any finals game ever, and they scored the most points in the first half of any finals game ever. It's almost lost with all the weird referee stuff around it. It seems so fishy that it doesn't seem like a legitimate game, a legitimate uh, records to have because yeah. all this kind of fishy stuff with the refereeing around it, right? It kind of takes away from some of the credit of it, I think. It does. Yeah. It does. You know, a little bit. Uh, I think overall we'll just remember the fact that the Warriors have now won two out of three. Durant yeah. joined them. He wins his first championship and gets finals MVP. Yeah. And that will be the, the through line of whatever stories that we remember going yeah. forward. I mean, maybe we'll remember how terrible that game was, but more than likely it'll just be a footnote in the overall, you know, historical yeah. arc of the series. What did you see that they did better than the Cavs? Like it's it's this is what was amazing for me to watch. I thought the Cavs really were gonna grind it out and drag it down into the mud. But you said to me a couple times, you know, when we were just talking about it, that they didn't have the team built to do that like they did two years ago. This is a different type of team. Well, that team two years ago, you lose Kevin Love, you lose Kyrie Irving, yeah, which they're not good defenders. Right. Love played okay over the the course of the playoffs yeah. on defense. Yeah. Kyrie's just not. Yeah. He's an offensive, you know, wizard. Yeah. But he just doesn't play lockdown defense. So at that point, the makeup of the team was okay. Well, we need to slow it down to half court pace make them fight through every pick, like just brutalize them and make it as physical as possible. And, you know, the fact that they they picked off, what, two games that series, yeah. that's more impressive to me than the championship last year mm-hmm. because, you know, LeBron and company were so undermanned that you're like, 
I thought he should have won Finals MVP. Yeah, over this time around, or do you mean two years ago? Two years ago. Yeah, yeah. When they lost, yeah, I was way more impressed by his effort that than mm-hmm. you know, you know, last year. Of course, he's going to win it yeah. when they win the championship. But that you know, Jerry West, I think, is the only one who's ever won an MVP on a losing team. Yeah, on a yeah. losing team. And yeah. I was like, if there's ever a year to do it, it would be this one because he carried this team on his back to two wins when yeah. they shouldn't have gotten it. Yeah. Whereas th- this year, it didn't. It didn't matter yeah. ultimately. Listen, you know. Curry has a bad game. They still have Durant. They still have Clay. They still have Draymond. Yep. If Durant has a bad game, which he didn't, but they still have yep. all the other people. And the thing is, there's still a threat. Even if they're having a bad game, you still have to respect the fact that they, they can still get hot. Yeah. So you need two of those guys to have a bad game, or potentially yeah. three of them, especially if Curry or Durant is just going to put up 30 regardless. Yeah. So I just don't know how any team this year would would beat them in a best of seven do you think it was that like what was it that you saw because we, we both watched decades of basketball what was it that you saw out of this warriors team that maybe you've never seen out of any other finals team like is this team does was their ball of movement just a product of the time of basketball now therefore it shouldn't be seen as amazing as anybody else or do you think this is something like next level basketball that we're watching here well i think it's hard to compare now to like you know uh the 96 bulls yeah or when you go back Lakers. that far, yeah. yeah. Or the, the early Celtics. '80s Lakers yeah. and the Celtics from yeah. those years and whatnot, or like the late '90 or late '80s Pistons or something yeah. like that, mm-hmm. because the rules have changed so much. If you put in hand checking and took away zone defense, I I, I don't know how effective this team is. I'm sure they're yeah. still excellent, yeah. but I without having seen it in the context of those rules, it's tough to compare and contrast. Right. Do I think they would do well in those eras? Sure. Yeah. Because you still have Steph Curry, arguably the greatest shooter in league history. Yeah. And Kevin Durant, a seven foot, seven foot one guy who can score from everywhere on the floor. <laughs> That's amazing. And what I don't understand is why they didn't do the Curry Durant pick and roll the entire season because yeah. it's absolutely unguardable. That's what I was hoping for all season. I was mm-hmm. like, dude, just run that twenty times a game. Yeah. Because it's pick your poison. Who okay, if you're gonna overcommit and try and trap on Curry, fine, you got Durant wide open. Yeah. Or if you're just gonna hedge and or switch or whatever the case is. Yeah. I, you know, yes, I think this team is one of the best ever. I don't know where it is because it's, once again, tough to compare and contrast, but I think they would translate across you yeah. know, numerous eras. Yeah. What I saw from from the Cavs in Game 4 that I that I, they didn't they weren't able to replicate in Game 5 was they were running like triple screens, both at the top and at the bottom of the key, and it was, it was the way that you have to beat the Warriors. It seemed like it worked effectively. Yes, the refereeing stuff, there were issues there too, but it seemed like they had found the formula finally. Yeah. And I, I didn't see most of that in game five. I didn't see hardly any of that in game five. And of course, Kevin Love went cold, which now people want to people say he should be traded now. Um, this is an interesting thing. It takes that kind of Herculean effort just to win one game, one game off of them in the finals. And that lets you know that they were just gearing up for the playoffs. Like they didn't need to win, win 73 games this year. They knew what they had. And once the playoffs started, they really implemented everything in their toolbox. And like you said, the Curry pick and roll with Durant Durant they didn't even pull that out until they needed to and they had yeah. that they had that sitting in the just a tool they could have totally used the whole season but they didn't pull yeah, it they, out until they needed to they ran it sparingly they're yeah. like that could be that's before the season started when people were upset they're they're complaining like all oh, this is unfair and yeah. be like well first off it's not and secondly right. like just enjoy from the pure basketball sense if you do genuinely love this game it sucks yeah. it's not your team but at the same time the offensive sets that they can run yeah. are unlike anything you're ever going to see again it's true it's it makes me like excited as a basketball fan and be like oh my god what if what if you run like a drag screen at the top and the first screener is Durant, second screener is Clay, yeah. and Durant rolls to the hoop, Clay flashes out to the three point line, and you still have Curry with the ball? Yeah. It's like <laughs> I don't even know what you do. <laughs> Who's the biggest threat? Because Clay also has the uncanny ability to not need to dribble the ball yeah. to fire up a quality shot. <laughs> And you're like, I don't know what the fuck you do at that point. It's true, man. Yeah. It's just like, I love, I, I mean, I wish my team had this many weapons. <laughs> and they did it. You know, a lot of people are complaining there's actually good backlash right now on Twitter and oh. online about this is unfair, what these guys are doing, this super team horse shit, and be like, well, the Warriors built this. Yeah. And then Durant joined. Yeah. That's not really building. This they, isn't Miami where they're colluding, you know, outside of public eye and going, let's all go here. Oh, I don't know if that happened. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know if they didn't talk about that at the Olympics, given the fact that all their free agencies lined up and they're all buddies. I push back against this, though. And, and this, we, we may have a, a, a difference of opinion here because I, I don't think LeBron necessarily joined a super team when he went with Bosch and Wade. Okay. I, don't, I, don't, I okay. really don't. I really don't. Because to me, super team implies you are stacked at all five positions. And I don't think they were stacked at all five positions. They had Bosch and they had Wade. But Wade was beginning the decline of Wade. He had maybe one or two years left and then he started to decline. And you saw that. And the first year, they didn't win the title. And the second year, they did. And the third year, you saw that, you know, they were running on fumes half the time between Bosch's injuries, Wade's injuries, and LeBron having to carry the team and do whatever. And yeah, I mean, it just, to me, that role players didn't go on and do much else after they left, you know, after LeBron left, after Wade left. None of those guys have glommed on to any other team and were anywhere successful like they were when they were playing with the Heat. So to me, the Warriors count more as a super team because Iguodala was the main guy for the Sixers for a long time, and he's coming off your bench. And you have guys sure. like David West, who was a good guy, who was a strong guy for the Pacers for a long time and whatever, and he's coming off your bench. And you have people like Sean Livingston. Those, those are great. Those are good players, right? Good role players. But you've got Durant, you've got Thompson, you've got Curry, you've got Draymond Green. Those four out of the top five, uh, four out of your five top, uh, 45 starters are like top players in the NBA. Yeah. That feels more like a super team than what they had in Miami, in my opinion. Yeah, but, it, it, you know, when you're comparing like, okay, LeBron and company, LeBron, Wade, Bosh, orchestrated moving together and combining forces. And you're talking about three perennial all-stars, yeah. which had never, this has never happened before. Now, you could let's say Boston, but Danny Ainge created that team. Right. So he made the moves to get that team together. It's mm -hmm. completely different when the players are saying, why don't we do this? Yeah, I would agree with you there because Pierce and Ray Allen and Garnett weren't necessarily guys that were carrying teams to the finals. LeBron yeah. had already carried Cleveland to the a finals. Terrible Wade, Cleveland team. Terrible, right. And Wade had also won a championship. Exactly. In the right, exactly. So when you're combining those and then now Bosch, who was numerous time all-star in Toronto at that yeah. point, just like, Jesus, I don't know what we can do against this team because they are they're you know, they have threats at three different positions yeah. and legitimate threats. Mm -hmm. Whereas these guys are considered some of the best, if not the best, at their position right. in the league right now. Yeah. So that to me is a super team. Now I, I understand when LeBron was like, I don't I don't feel like I've ever been on any super team. I understand what he's saying. Uh right. A, it's like I don't want to deal with this question when you see him <laughs> answer it. Yeah, that's true. I just lost. Yeah. Like why do I need to answer this horse shit? Right. And you know, B, what what is a super team? Yeah, it's like kind of a stupid, arbitrary de definition of you can define just as you're doing. You're saying Miami wasn't. Yeah, I can say Miami was. Right. It's just like, well, what is it's a, a super matter of team? opinion? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's it's arbitrary at best. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I get what LeBron is saying. My question now is, okay, they yeah. need to move Love. They do. Absolutely. It's unfortunate because the guy can play. He can play. He just can't play on this team. I think that's yeah. the problem. True. Yeah. That's their only asset, though, because yeah. they're not going to give up Kyrie. No. And all the rumors of, does LeBron leave after next year? It's completely legitimate. Well, he's kind of screwed them over in the way that he's done. And please, let's be honest. I know David... Screw them over is a little harsh. Well, I mean... David Griffin is entitled the general manager, but you know everything is run through LeBron. And so, yeah. so this idea of LeBron leaving next year, he could... And he could just be like, look, I gave you guys three or four years of- Got you a championship. Yeah, got you a championship. I, did, I, I can go where I want to go. Because there's rumors he might go to the Lakers. Russell might go to the Lakers. Uh, uh, George, Paul George might go to the Lakers. There's all kinds of rumors about who's going to be the Lakers, who's going to be the Lakers. And it's certainly possible. But what will he leave in the coffers when he leaves? Like, how many draft picks will they have left? Nothing. What, what, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Nothing. So, and that's what I mean when I say that he kind of screwed them over because he, like, pushed these deals to go through Tristan, paying Tristan as much as they pay Tristan for really very little return in the finals, you know? And so those kinds of yeah. things. Yeah, one things. good game. One good game. And he one. orchestrated that. JR finally showed up in the last two games, and it was too late, Yeah, you know? And so these are the kind of deals that, that uh, LeBron approved to get these people in here. Deron Williams was almost absent except for game four. Uh, and same thing with Corver. Corver was a sieve on defense. My Lord, he was getting destroyed. What's he going to do? Yeah, what do you expect yeah, yeah. from a mid to late 30s guy who's basically just there to be He's a, a sharp shooting white guy? Exactly. That's his role. <laughs> right. Channing hardly got anything going on while he was playing as well. So it's it, these are the things that I... 
I wonder where he goes next. You're right. I, I, I don't think he stays. I, why would you stay? You're about to enter the twilight of your career, and he is in two, two or three years. I think it stay? comes down to a calculus of what do I want my legacy to be? Because if I leave again, then now I'm just a gun for hire. Yeah. I just go to wherever the situation is best. Yeah. And I think that undercuts his goat argument on some level because mm-hmm. he wants to be better than Jordan, which means you need to get to six championships, as dumb a thing as that is. Yeah. Like, personally, I, I still don't think he's better than Jordan, but at the same time, like, I can understand the discussion. Right. The guy is a beyond, he's a generational, he is an, an NBA pantheon talent. Yeah. When you watch him, like at the end of game five, what was it, four straight possessions where yeah. he just dribbled down, did a little spin move, layup, and there's nothing you can do. Absolutely nothing. And now, it, it's, it's completely different from like when Shaq would do that back in the day just because you're really big. Yeah. And there's, we have to double and triple team you just because of your immense size. Right. Whereas LeBron has that size, but he also has the grace, the agility, the skill. Like yeah. he can finish with either hand. He shoots really well when he gets down in the paint like yeah. that. Like it's it's next level stuff. And his basketball IQ is off the charts. Yeah, it is. For running the entire team, his basketball IQ is off the charts. You know, and so you have to wonder. You're right. Okay, so if they get, who do you think they bring in? Do you think they go get Paul? Do they trade Paul George straight up for Kevin Love? Do they try to work that out with Indiana? What do I you think do happens? That with Indiana. Yeah, tell me who do you think they can bring in that that would be of use to them. Well, I mean, you want to trade a star for a star. The best yeah. two stars that are available out there are Paul George and Jimmy Butler. And I don't know why either team would trade for Kevin Love because yeah. you would want assets in return. Give me right. some sort of draft pick, and any draft pick you're going to get from him is not going to be worthwhile. Yeah. So I don't know what value Kevin Love has unless you can trade for a young up-and-coming guy that mm-hmm. you think is going to be something and another yeah. team is willing to. But why would any team want to get out from underneath a good contract to do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I wonder if there's a trade with the Celtics to be made because the Celtics have picks. Maybe they say, LeBron, listen, we got to make this move, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you're going to leave after next year, let us leave at least with some picks. Let us have some picks. You can ride this out for one more year. Maybe you can carry a team to the finals, whatever. You know, it's still you going to eight straight finals is still something to hang your hat on that Jordan never did. And so, you know, there's certainly possibilities. It could be negotiations where they trade Kevin Love for some picks and maybe pick up another journeyman shooter on the wing. I don't know, but... Love gives you rebounding, man. Love gives you a presence inside that Tristan is can be uh, can be hot uh, hot and cold depending on the situation, you know. Yeah. And so I don't know what what's out there for them. And you're right because Paul George and Jimmy Butler ain't going to be banging on the inside, and that's where you lose uh, the statistics of Kevin Love. You lose the presence of a Kevin Love inside because he yeah. he was really fantastic in rebounding the ball throughout the whole season, and he showed no fear of going inside. And we saw that in the finals too, mm-hmm. quite a few times. So I think that's what you lose if you get rid of Kevin Love. Love, but who's going to come in and want to be under LeBron's like leadership? LeBron, because you know, as Jordan, as crazy as Jordan was, LeBron is kind of a passive aggressive leader, which bothers me sometimes. I yeah, mean, the social media little swipes of yeah. like when he went after, not went after, but like the the Kevin Love stuff yeah. is either you're with us or you're not kind of thing, right. and you're like, well, why don't you just reach out to the guy? There was a good article about Channing Fry pulling them all together. Yeah, that was an interesting like creating the text chain yeah and just starting stupid arguments because then guys have commonality when they're fighting on the uh, the side of a dumb argument yeah right like who's better this or that and then suddenly you have commonality with somebody else that you've never really talked to before yeah or you don't have any kind of bond yeah but now in practice or shoot around or something you can sit there on the side while you're shooting be like can you believe such and such (laughs) like that you know that clown over this and just like something dumb but it does bond people when you have that um, but yeah, going forward, I, I don't know what they do because even if they yeah. trade, say they got draft picks back from Boston, why mm-hmm. would LeBron want that? Because that draft yeah. pick is not going to be ready for two to three years. Yeah. So you tell me that the last closing gasps of his window are going to be spent helping nurture yeah. the next round of potential gaps. That's like, weird. Yeah. I wouldn't buy that if I was him. Do you think that he made a mistake getting rid of, and, and, and they did win a championship. So this is, this is maybe not a good argument, but do you think he made a mistake Shipping out uh, what Wiggins Wiggins for for uh, uh, Kevin Love? I don't know. I, at the time, I saw him at summer league, mm-hmm. and it was me and a buddy, and a friend of his was texting him saying, um, "How does Wiggins look?" Look, and yeah. he was a Cavs fan, and we both said, "If you can get love for him right now, because he was disappearing on the court against yeah. completely lesser talent." Yeah, just like oh shit, I forgot 
Andrew Wiggins is on the court. Now, granted, he was 18, 19 yeah. at the yeah, time, yeah. so it's completely different as you mature into your role. But just from payroll alone, yes, because then they'd have the flexibility. They more than likely wouldn't have forced a trade for J.R. Smith and Amon Shumpert, yeah. so they wouldn't have those contracts hanging over their heads, potentially. But at the same time, I, I don't know if him, having him on the team gives you the dynamic to win last year's championship yeah. maybe i i don't know it's a good question you know and the, yeah does he bring does he bring you a championship uh in that in last year does he possibly yeah. do it is he is he an integral part of the team is he mature enough at that point to be able to do what you need to do you know cuz he can do what he's doing on Minnesota because they're a young team and there's space yeah. for him and Carl Anthony Towns to do what they need to do with the point guard stuff is always uh, up in the air with Rubio there but he still has space to do what he needs to do would he've had the same space and would he've had the patience from LeBron cuz like we like I mentioned earlier his way of passive aggressive leading like this is why he'll never be better to me no matter how many championships he wins he'll never be better than Jordan to me because Jordan would have never allowed himself to lose to the Warriors or the Spurs because Jordan would have never taken a picture of himself a selfie in the mirror with a sad face talking about how he needs to focus up and be stronger and blah 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 like that's not Michael Jordan at all and no Jordan would have found a way he would have found a way he was always mentally stronger than every other player he played against on the court even Barkley even he just found a way to get under the skin to get better to get smarter get stronger against them no matter what was going on and I don't think LeBron always has that gear i think lebron has the fallback that i'm better than everyone on the court therefore i can blame them if i lose i don't have to work as hard, or i get upset i don't push as hard because they're not pushing as hard as i am okay and i want that's my take on it i don't know what you think sure i uh, i mean as of right now i still have yet to see anybody better than jordan yeah i just i haven't yeah now, some of that comes from the fact that he is 6 and 0 in the finals and he will always loom in that realm of you can't beat him when the pressure is on. Yeah. Um, who knows if that's, you know, had he stayed for the two years instead of going to play baseball. Yeah. Whether or not they go 8-0 and or maybe they go 6-8 and or maybe they don't even make the championship those two years. Or, right. Yeah, maybe we don't get the second three-peat because he's just so burnt out because doing what LeBron is doing right now is somewhat incredible. Yeah. The only reason I say somewhat is because the East in the past eight years has been pathetic. Yeah, yeah. So... You know, I, I've had people say, oh, you know, this is absolutely incredible. He's eight straight years and be like, well, okay, well, who's the other dominant East team that he's actually had to square off against? Yeah. yeah. Give me one. Yeah. Like what? The Celtics back in 2012? Yeah. Okay, sure, maybe, kind of ish. Uh, I think that's a fair point. Pacers. Right. Jordan had to go through the Knicks, the Pacers, yeah. and the Pistons. And the Pistons. Yeah, all in their prime all of three. their runs. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the. Pistons were just coming off winning their own back-to-back -back championship, right. and we finally beat them and then then get the championship. Yep. Pacers and Knicks very well could have in either of those years where they took us to seven, seven. in the Eastern Conference Finals, yeah. could have won the championship thereafter because sure. they were strong teams. And everybody out of the East, like from 2000 or 2001 on, the West has been one of the greatest conferences mm -hmm. in any kind of sport. Yeah. Just the amount of talent that they have. I feel bad for all these guys that are just like like Gordon Haywood making the decision of do I stay or do I go. That yeah. nucleus on Utah is great, yeah. but you still have to go through the Warriors yeah. to get to the finals. Yep. And the Spurs. And right. Oklahoma City. Right. And Houston. And that's just the top four teams. Right. You still have the Clippers looming. You still have like, you know, there's yeah. other teams like Memphis is hanging on, but they're still a pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah. And they're not even, you know, what, a top eight team? No. Top nine team? Yeah, and then you have Portland as well. If, if Little and McCollum, if they ever figure this thing out uh -huh. 100% and bringing in Nurkic really helped them go to the next level. So it's like, okay, if they have a whole offseason now to incorporate him into the system and then pick up a couple of more pieces, what does this mean for Portland? How do they get higher? And the Nuggets too with, yeah. they, with that trade as Young, well. Young, like, interesting team. Yep. Whereas in the East, you're like, I don't know, the Celtics? Yeah, or the Wizards. But my Wizards they, are, are... I think they're defeatable. I was Yeah, and I was going to say this may have been their last gasp with Gortat and with uh, 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 Morris on the end there there's only so much longer those guys are going to hold on so my wizards like i wouldn't be surprised if john yeah. wall or, or you're going to max took porter along. yep and then your salary cap is going to be inflexible yep yep and then i don't know what that team does yeah because our, our bench was uh, we got exposed against the celtics because again our because what everyone had said all year our bench was an issue and our bench really came back to bite us and i think yeah. the Cavs bench did too they only scored seven points in that last game when they lost the finals that seven seven points that whole bench that's insane yeah that's insane that's not what you need out of your bench but you know? so if i'm hayward because now yeah. apparently he's according to reports he has genuine interest in miami yeah but 
the reason LeBron has stayed in the East is because the East is pathetic. Yeah. So all you need to do is beat the Cavs. Yeah. That's it. Well, that's why I think he doesn't go to the Lakers unless like Russell Westbrook shows up or unless there's two or three other pieces on that team because why would he go to perennially get beat by the Warriors over and over and yeah. over again? So I don't think he'd go to the Lakers un- unless that was a situation that made sense. And there have been these rumblings that they might trade Kyrie for Chris Paul. I'm like, are you fucking mind? Are you out of your fucking mind? I would not break down. I would not trade a, a point guard who's one knee injury away from being done yeah. in his career for Kyrie. There's and no way. once a five-year, $201 million yeah. deal. Yeah, fuck all that. At 31 years 32. old, 32? yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fuck all that, dude. So that means the last two years of that are just going to be an albatross hanging over yeah. the, the neck yeah. or, you know, circling over the head of whatever team is unfortunately going to be paying that because may- maybe he's still good at 37. Yeah. But I, I don't know. As a point guard? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. As a journeyman point guard at 37. Not, not, not like stellar. Like Nash was the last one I saw that was remotely decent at 37 years old, you know, at that age. So yeah. it's tough as a point guard because there's so much wear and tear on your body. You're not banging inside, but you're constantly moving and moving around and running the offense and doing a lot of the jerks mm-hmm. and movements on your knees. It's not easy, you know. So, what do you think happens now with the war? They just do you think they stay in the same nucleus? Do you think they need? The, I mean, because like the Patriots, they could improve too. The Patriots always find a way to improve every year. Do you think there's something that they're like? Is there anyone they want to dump and drop off or take take away and pick up someone else? Do you see that happening at all? Well, Duran has already indicated that he'll take less money than the max. That's amazing. Dude. And by doing that, it doesn't even have to be much. No, no, it just has to be a couple million dollars, and that allows them the flexibility then because if they max him then they max uh curry curry's getting the max because yeah. he's never been the highest paid player right now right. he's making 12 million dollars a year it's insane it is he's like the 38th highest player in the league or 28th highest. yeah that's ridiculous just ridiculous game five uh just about paid for his salary for the year yeah. it did because <laughs> they right. made when uh, there was a report on espn of breaking down and these are just <laughs> conservative numbers they made 11 million dollars yeah for that one game he makes 12 million yeah his salary is paid for yeah in one fucking game so if Durant takes less, then they have the money then to resign all their guys, mm-hmm. and they can extend their cap over. It doesn't matter at that point, yeah. as long as they have enough wiggle room in the middle, yeah. so they can resign Livingston and Iguodala and anybody else they want to. And then they're still going to get good veteran guys yeah. who want to come for the minimum. Do you think they'll drop? Do you think they'll get rid of P- Pachulia? Do you think the whole controversy with him messing around with Leonard and the punches to Shum? Do you think they? Do you think, think they want that kind of chippiness on the team? I think if they got him for the right price, they'd keep him. Yeah, because he was okay. good for him. Yeah, he was. I mean, he was, yeah, he, he did his job. Yeah, he yeah. brought some problems. Right. The Kawhi thing, because he has a history, I understand what you're saying, but I don't think that was maliciously. It didn't seem that way. No, but he might have. But Maybe it doesn't I don't it, it isn't so obvious no. in my because he had his eye he had his head turned away completely yeah and then he did move his leg out a little bit further out but he, he, he if if anything he's just taking a chance that something might happen but in no way was he like deliberately trying yeah. to make it you can't happen. prove the intent no no like Whereas, when he punched Schumper to the balls that was deliberate yeah, yeah. exactly that was where there was a the high screen he said on Westbrook earlier in the season yeah. where he just oh, shoulder yeah. checked him in the jaw right and you're like that was that was intentional yeah. <laughs> There's no denying, even if you turn around and be like, what? And be like, shut the fuck up. Yeah. Like, I'd almost tee him up for being an asshole at that point if I was a ref. And be like, you know exactly what you did. Don't give me this six-year-old defense of like, I did nothing. Bullshit. (laughs) Whereas the Leonard, like, that sucks. Yeah. Because the Spurs might have been able to make that competitive. And they were destroying them that first half of game one. Yeah. Whether or not they can maintain that going forward, who knows? Because once again, even if the Warriors lost game one, yeah. they have more firepower than anybody else in the league, and they're a really good defensive uh, right. team. So, Do you think Hayward and Love could go to the Celtics? Do you think that would be helpful? Are they playing? like Because you'd have Love as power, and, and yeah, but what do you be your shooting forward. What do you have to give up to, to get picks. Love? It would be picks. It would be the only way you'd get Love is picks, because well, there's no one on, on the Celtics team that they would take that would slide right in. Avery Bradley, a defending two that they don't have right now, who can get get a little bit hot because they have a glut of guards if they get uh, a Hayward. Yeah, so they'll need to get rid of one to two of these guards to get enough, you know, playing time and shots for Hayward to yeah. make this justifiable. Yeah, because you still have Smart, you still have Thomas, you have Rozier, uh, and I think there's like one or two other guys. Yeah, You're like you have a lot of guards. What are you going to do with all this crap? Right. So I don't I don't know if I was them I mean if you could get rid of some of the extra pieces that you already have that you can't find playing time for anyway yeah. some for whatever reason Cleveland overvalues them and get love in return sure you slide him in at the four position 
Yeah. Uh, you keep Horford at the five. Yeah. Hayward's yeah. there at the three, and then or at the two rather. Wouldn't wouldn't Hayward but, be at the two? Yeah, he, he might be at the three. Actually. Three, yeah, right. Um, so then you have your guards, and then you have Isaiah at point. You know. Yeah. Do you think they there was all these things about trading Isaiah or, or like because because they have the highest pick in the draft and blah blah. blah. Do you think that's a possibility they would trade Isaiah? If the right offer came along, sure. I don't think Danny Ainge would not trade him. Right. If somebody offered the moon for him, yeah. Yeah. Do you want a 5'9 point guard that wants max money? I mean, look, the guy's good, but yeah. zero on defense. I just wonder if he's a shooting... Like, would, would the Cavs... Be, like, could, could he be the shooting guard sliding in with Kyrie at... At the point with would would Isaiah kind of give up ball handling duties a little bit because then you'd have you'd essentially have three point guards with LeBron on you know running your offensive sets at any time. It could be something, but you you'd lose a lot losing Kevin. Like the rebounding is huge. Yeah, that, that's massive, man. Yeah, yeah, I don't. And I don't right, see defensive how that works. Liabilities are huge with Isaiah too. Yeah, yeah I don't see how that works with Isaiah just because for him to do what he does, he needs the ball in his hands. Right. So whatever team that he is on needs to have basically a bunch of shooters so he can palm the ball and travel his way around the key. <laughs> That's what he does. That's a Bulls fan talking there. Yeah, uh, but at the same time, when you want, like, <laughs> once again, it, it sucks to watch, but it's the NBA. Yeah. Guys can do that. Yeah, Steph double dribbles all the fucking time. Like the, go back and watch Iverson clips. Yeah, Like, true. I palm the ball oh more God. than just about anybody that's ever played the game. You're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Just like it's the NBA. If you're not going to call it, once he reaches superstar status, yeah. which he pretty much has, mm-hmm. he's never going to get called for that. Even though yeah. there are points where I've seen clips where people break it down. Here's numerous from this game, right? Where he takes three steps, four steps when he's running at the top of the key and he's just yeah. holding the ball yeah. like a goddamn waiter. And you're like, <laughs> fuck, man. If he doesn't put the ball down, how do I defend this? Because you know yeah. he can go any which way at this point. It's just frustrating. As a you know non uh, the, yeah. other, the opposing team or any other team, I still wonder what my what my Wizards would have done against the Cavs in the in the finals. I don't think we would have gotten swept, and I, I would have no. liked to have seen what we we could have done with our team and our core five that can play forty minutes a game. You know, it would have been interesting to see how far we put have, we could have pushed the Cavs. I would have liked to have seen that, which is why I was so mad. Uh, we lost that game in Boston. Like, I was just so mad. We had that game, and we just kind of mentally broke down. John Wall just ran out of gas, and it's it's a shame, you know. So we'll see. All right, so let's wrap this up real quick. What do you see happening now? You definitely do, I'm sure you see Golden State back in it next year. Mm-hmm. Um, do you do you see the Cavs coming back? If they Even if they don't do a damn thing in the offseason, do you think they still come back and, and, and compete? And if contend? the Celtics get Hayward, then it makes it interesting. But yeah. otherwise, if, if it's status quo and yeah. nobody really adds anything huge, then yeah, yeah Cavs again. Right. Because who's going to stop him? Yeah. You still have LeBron. I mean, this year he played more minutes than he ever should have. Uh, yeah. He, you know, his numbers in the finals, had he been able to play every second of every game, they potentially could have won. Yeah, he scored 41 points in the game they lost, in the last game of the, the finals. 41 points? Yeah. That's madness. He, that's a, Average, just, you know, triple double. Everything Kevin did, LeBron did, he just did it for a losing team. But Kevin wasn't the leader of the team like LeBron is. You know, Kevin was. Yeah. Curry is the leader of that Now, team. do you feel bad for Curry at this point? Steph Curry? Yeah. Not a fucking bit do I feel bad for Steph Curry. Well, I'm just saying in regards to <laughs> because he hasn't been finals MVP twice. So who cares? He has the title. He is the point guard. Yeah, but it's now he's clearly not the best player on his own team. No, he's on not. On his team. No, he's not. So but these guys, he invited it. Yeah, he did. And these guys are different. I feel like these guys are all about winning championships. And they're almost like the Spurs in a different way. They're more they're a flashier Spurs team is what I think. And, okay. and sure. not just because of their uniforms. I just think their uh, uh, their mentality, you know. And and Steve Kerr was assistant coach for the Spurs for a long time under Popovich. So, you know, there's there's that element of the Spurs type of of, of game plan. I wonder what happens if Jerry West leaves. If he goes to the Clippers, if that really affects the overall basketball decisions of that team going forward over the next two to three years, five years even, you know, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, but no, I don't think, I think Curry, I think Curry's happy to be a champion. That's what he's going to hang his hat True. on. He's not really a big media personality. His, his commercials are boring as fuck. His shoes are dumb. So to him, <laughs> he's not the typical smart basketball player in terms of marketing of himself. Do you know what I'm saying? And Durant, Durant's that same way too. Durant, to me, we can talk. Let's talk about this real quick. For I know I got to go here, but like, 
I'm a little, I'm still a little mad at Durant. I'm still a little upset with what he did. I didn't mind LeBron going to Miami. I had an pr- issue with the way he did it. Absolutely. I think the decision was dumb as shit. But I had no issue with him going. He had a, he had a right to pursue a ring because Cleveland was letting him but down. But somehow Durant doesn't? No, because I don't think Oklahoma City was letting him down. I think Oklahoma City was doing the best they could to put the pieces around him to make him work. I don't think they put any boogie, boogie, whatever that fool was that played for the the Cavs the first time they went through the went to the finals that that, that shooting oh yeah, yeah, that guy. yeah, yeah. Uh, the, oh whatever yeah, his yeah. Name it's was. not boogie but it's it's, booby i don't no. know what his name was yeah booby cousins booby cousins yeah they, they didn't they, no that's cousins. Cousins. booby cousins uh, booby gibson booby gibson yeah they didn't have those guys or or, or or that dude that slept with lebron's mom or supposedly they didn't have that yeah, kind of whether or not that happened yeah they didn't have that kind of issues there i i thought oklahoma city was trying because it's a small market team they're not going to bring in the massive amounts of people to to do what they need to do and again he shit the bed in game seven against the warriors so to me when he left i thought it was a coward leaving a bad situation to try and get a ring and so that's my issue with it that's my issue if he had scored 35 points 40 points and given everything he could in the fourth quarter it was russell or the other teammates that let him down then i could understand that but he shit the bed in that game seven against the warriors so for him to run off and go play for the i mean yeah go play for the warriors i thought was shit and so and he's not even and he said in the post game it's nice to be one of the guys and not be the main guy and i'm like okay, that's why then that's what you are then don't tell me you're some kind of silent you're some kind of assassin you're some kind of leap no you're another player on a team. That's what you are. You're not LeBron. You're not Jordan. You're not Magic. You're not Larry Bird. You're not in that realm. Hell, you're not even James Harden who leads his team. You are another good player on a. You're another great player on a good team, a great team. But you're not the main alpha dog. I. The thing is, when he made that move, I understood it. Yeah. As a guy that has watched and and still plays basketball every week. Yeah. Because I there's when I show up like a, there's a a group of us about twenty or twenty five of us that show up every week and yeah. play, so we get numerous games going. And there's uh, two guys that I do not like playing with. They're they're both really good players. Right. One is easily the best player there. Wow. But he doesn't pass. Right. He barks at you if you don't do everything to his specifications. I feel I know where you're going here. Well, it's. <laughs> And it sucks. Even like there was one day where we won the entire day. So we held, yeah. we had to do with A court, B court, C court, depending on how many people show up. Yeah. We held A court all fucking day. Wow. And uh, the two games where we blew everybody out, we passed the ball. Yeah. And we moved around and it was a lot of fun. And the games that we eked out, it was him going one on. Right. How many ever defenders are in front of him? He's going ISO. Yeah. Yeah. And just like, well, what's the fucking fun of watching you just run into four guys? Yeah. Every time, and then be like, why did you get that rebound? Be like, why did you go up against four fucking defenders? You just threw up a wild fucking shot, and you have to yell at him, and then he gets pissed off. Right. And uh, just one of those of you, like, look, man, I'm not saying I'm a better player than you. Right. You are a more superior athlete. It's not even a fucking question. It's right. not even close. But at the same time, just like, I would rather lose all day on a team that passes and has fun yeah. than watch you just do this shit. Yeah. So when Durant left, it'd be like, I get it, because... Your team was dysfunctional in that it's my turn, it's Russ's turn. Yeah. It's my turn. It's like we pass the ball, but not really. Yeah. So it's basically just a glorified double ISO team. And you look at the Warriors, and it's just like, no, it's best available shot. Right. And we keep passing, moving, and we make this offense as fun as humanly possible. I would want to play on that team. Well, do you think it was Russell's personality that brought that out in Kevin, that he had to be, he had to fight for the alpha dog status with Russell? Because he didn't mm-hmm. seem like he was fighting for the alpha dog status with Curry. Like, Curry was happy to take a back seat to a degree and figure out how to integrate Get him into the Get to the team's the detriment system. early on. Right, early on, yeah, exactly. And Kevin was having his issues, too. You know, they talk about this now, that that breakdown in, in Memphis, when they lost to Memphis, you know, Draymond had Yeah, when he yelled at him. him. Yeah, when he yelled at him. Like, those are those things. And even uh, Iguodala, when... 50 50 seconds left in the last game of the finals. Kevin like stopped at mid court and put his head down. It was just like kind of say, uh, yeah, it was like, emotional. Yeah, emotional. And Iggy's like, we still got 50 seconds. Get the fuck back on. on yeah, defense. even though we're up by 11. Yeah. <laughs> and so I wonder about this. I think maybe this was a better situation because they were willing to accept Kevin and they don't, none of them have that personality that Russell has. I mean, maybe Draymond, but Draymond's not that kind of player that Russell is. Yeah. So it just, it seemed like a better, like Kevin wanted to go to a more, a team, touchy feely type situation. Yeah, yeah, a team. yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. I think you're you're right on that account yeah. because Russell rubbed off on him yeah. over the years. So then he started become you know, he was a media Durant was a media darling yeah. for a number of years, and then Russ rubbed off on him, and yeah. he's said it publicly, just like I feel like my you know 
the worst parts of me. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing here. Rubbed off on Durant. So now he's defiant and like, you know, kind of screw you guys yeah. and standoffish with the media. Whereas before he was, you know, maybe quiet or reserved or whatnot, but he yeah. was respectful and nice and would answer their questions. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think so. I think, you know, I don't want to sit here and bash Russ because he is one of, if not my favorite player to watch in a regular season game. Yeah. The guy just gives 100%. He does. It's absolutely, it is pure energy. It is, you know, it's Jordan and Kobe, F you. I am going to do everything I can to beat you. Yeah. It's fantastic to watch. I don't know if I want to play with it. Yeah. Because as like in the playoffs, you saw what it did, which is like a, you have guys wide open, yet you're trying to go one on three. Yeah. Consistently over and over again. It's just like, that's a bad move. Yeah. You have to trust in your teammates because otherwise, A, the defense doesn't respect them, and B, they're not going to have the confidence to shoot that in the future. So you're yeah. just kind of screwing yourself doubly. Exactly. Well, there you go. All right. Well, I think we've talked to him as much as we can talk about the NBA and the finals there. Matt, thanks for coming on the Outlaw Nation podcast. I got to say it like that, right? Like a big cheesy, the Outlaw Nation podcast. No, but I really appreciate it, dude. This was a fun ass discussion. You know, I love talking NBA with you, and I'm glad we finally get the forum to do it every once sure. in a while when we can. Uh, and then, of course, I'm sure we'll talk about it again as it goes on. Uh, Matt, you want to do you want to plug anything? Do you want to tell anybody anything that you're doing? Or are you cool just being Matt Nost? Um, well, you said the one thing on the on the other didn't you get interviewed oh i think i saw you and you were like hey this thing is gonna happen oh what thing are you talking about what thing do you think i don't know what we're talking about our tag team titles we're talking about what five 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 time five ten never mind <laughs> just follow me at matt nose wait hold on say it. at matt nose on, on twitter oh yeah so yeah the, i didn't know if you we were sitting on that well we're still sitting on it i think we're still discussing it there so here's what matt is referring to Christian and I, I think and they, Matt, I think they already pieced it together. Yeah, Christian and Matt and I are discussing uh, bringing back the Top Ten Show on the SK Plus podcast channel. I guess I can kind of announce that. I don't know if it's going to happen, but we are as close as we've ever been to bringing the show back. Matt and I are definitely on board. It's a matter of working out the logistics with Christian and with the SK Plus podcast channel. Uh, so those are the things that are happening. So I think there's one, that's exactly yeah, what Matt I was just referencing. didn't know. Yeah. So he, he was right to remind me because I've got a million things going on in my fucking head, and I should have focused on that too. But yes, we. Matt and I are negotiating it with Christian. So the top 10 show may be coming back uh, sooner than you think. So Yeah, it's the only reason I bring it up because it seems like, I'm not saying it's a foregone conclusion, yeah. but we've worked out a lot of, on our end, yeah. what needs to happen between the two of us. Yes, I think, you know, there's, I'm sure there would be other things that come up along the way, but yeah. just like, a, hey, what if we did it this way this time yeah. to just ease certain aspects of it for each other yeah. and just be like okay yeah why don't we do that and then so now it's just a matter of uh, a few other things that are you know uh up to christian up yeah. to sk podcast up to a couple other things yeah. but it seems as though it yeah. should go a certain way that we would be back on the air the momentum has picked up more the over the list this particular possibility faster than any other possibility that had been going on before so and it's it's thanks to the people that are tuning yes, into this show absolutely absolutely people tune in outlaw nation people tune into the other stuff that we do like they absolutely have been talking about and commenting on other people's shows on youtube and on i know yeah going after bringing back the top 10 so it's it's as close as it's ever been. So we'll and we'll officially announce it, obviously, on our social medias if we make the deal and it happens for real. And, yeah. And Matt and I are excited to do it. And like you said, we worked out logistics, and I think it works out for both of us. The but possibility I, of it. I would say carpet bomb Christian's Twitter. <laughs> Just a full scorched earth policy, guys, out there. If anybody's on Twitter, if you follow him on Instagram. <laughs> Because on Facebook, I think you can just turn that off, whereas on the others, he's going to see those notifications. It's going to pop right up every time he opens the app. You know, you can say that, asshole, because I'm the one who has to see him all the time. He gets <laughs> for it. He gets a I'll it. see him in a couple of days, but it, I don't know when this comes out. So uh, Thursday. comes out tomorrow. Okay, then. well, yeah, you so. know, then... Uh, <laughs> Then <laughs> the next day when I see him, that's right. Could be a problem. I, I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. All right. Well, thanks again, Matt. I really appreciate coming yep, on the show. Thanks for having Always me. Always a blast. Uh, thanks again for the guys, everybody listening to Outlaw Nation Podcast. I'll be right back to finish out the show after this musical break. All right, there you go. Matt Nost and I talking the NBA Finals, talking about what's going to happen in the NBA now as a result of the Golden State Warriors winning the Finals the way they did, with the style that they did, with the, the style of play, rather, that they did, and with the players that they have. So 
We'll see what happens. Uh, guys, I want to tell you all, thank you so much for listening to the Outlaw Nation podcast. Really appreciate it. This was a long one, and uh, things just kind of worked out in a certain way to have these three awesome people come on my show. Jay Washington with the Black Panther trailer, Mark T. Uh, Mark, T- Mark Taylor Noberman uh, with Mark Tyler Noberman rather with uh, with uh, Batman and Bill documentary and of course Matt with the NBA so uh, uh, if you're listening if you made it this far thank you so much I so appreciate it I so appreciate you downloading it on iTunes or downloading on on YouTube but reach out to me let me hear what you think about the things we had to say throughout this entire podcast uh, you know send tweet me your comments or send me your comments or DM me your comments or or comment on YouTube you know uh, you know uh, subscribe to the channel there's so many amazing uh, shows here on the SK plus podcast channel the Wanger show don't be a beardo uh, the schmo down rundown the after schmo show there's so much happening and I hope I'm not missing any other shows but there's so much happening on the SK Plus podcast channel. Subscribe to all the shows. Leave them comments. You know, uh, uh, let them know that you're listening to their shows. You know, I would appreciate it. I'm sure Kristen appreciates. It. I'm sure everybody involved in those shows appreciates it. So, thanks again for listening to me. If you want to follow me on on uh, social media, you can follow me at the Roca says R O C H A on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, you know, I'm trying to get up there with Twitter and Instagram. I'm trying to get like you know a large number of followers. So please follow me if you haven't followed me yet. Uh, leave me your comments, uh, ratings, whatever, subscribe to the channel, all those things you're supposed to do for the SK Plus podcast channel. We would all appreciate it. Um, not too much uh, inspirational stuff this week. We had, a lot of ch- we had an episode that's chock full of, of a lot of information, a lot of fun interviews. So all I'll say is what I say every week. Fight for your life. Do the work. Keep going forward. Find a way to get through every day. If you have to go minute to minute, Hour to hour, day to day. Do it. You can do it. Find the joy. Find your happiness. Find what makes you tick. And don't care what anyone else thinks. Don't care what anyone else thinks. Whatever you need to do to be able to do that. Because that's going to corrupt how you enjoy your life. Live your life. No one else can live your life but you. So go do that. Get out there and do that this week. All right? And send me your comments. Send me your messages uh, if, if, if I've inspired you or the conversations today, uh, on this show has inspired you, uh, to go and pursue your dreams or pursue anything that you're trying to do in life. All right. There you go. I'm the outlaw. You know, I'm always in your corner. You know, I'm always fighting for you. And, uh, we'll see you all next week on the outlaw nation podcast. Y'all dealing with the king. If you wanna come and get it, let the outlaw get you out your seats. You want sports talk politics? He don't give a shit. Everyone can say speak, follow it. About to issue y'all a master class. You wanna pass? Come slinging the new podcast, eat candy ass. Robert Toss, bitch, get information. It's your boy John Roker. Welcome to the Outlaw Nation.